Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to the RSC Conference 2020. We're going to spend the day looking at securing the future of power systems with digital cooperation. My name is Johanna Stralla. I'm a journalist for Estonian Public Broadcasting. And I must say today's venue and debates both highlight the opportunities, but also the challenges we face in these interesting times. European electricity markets are more integrated than ever before. Now, even though COVID restrictions often prevent us from traveling to visit our dear neighbors, power grids can rely on our regional partners. And well, luckily, electricity still travels fast. The digital tools that have served us throughout the pandemic and also make this online conference possible also demand investments. Now, not only to maintain the maximum performance these innovative solutions provide, but also to keep systems safe from cyber threats. And then there's the energy transition. Going green, undoubtedly good for the planet, but also will bring challenges for the system operators. Dear friends, these are some of the very timely issues that we will discuss today. And you are, of course, welcome to join the conversation and post your questions by signing in to Slido using the event code RSC2020. Something tells me we're going to have an electrified debate. Now, I'm pleased to hand over the virtual floor to the European Commissioner for Energy, Kadri Simson, for her opening statement. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you for inviting me to speak at today's conference. I am honoured to share a few thoughts on how I see the future challenges of the power sector before you kick things off with further discussions. The European Green Deal sets us on a clear path towards a system largely based on renewable generation. This is good for our climate and for you, the system operators. At the same time, the new electricity world is also more challenging. Renewable generation is less stable, decentralized and far away from consumption centers. The integrated EU electricity grid, still the largest of its kind, provides a unique opportunity to cope with these challenges. European electricity markets are more and more integrated. This is increases security of supply, saves money and CO2 because we can rely on our neighbours and their backup solutions. However, those changes also make your job more complex. The first concern of TSOs is, and should be, the security of supply. You are facing a challenging situation with decentralised and more interconnected systems, climate change creating more unpredictable weather conditions and malicious cyber and hybrid threats. A regional approach for pinpointing risks and developing preventive measures will be key. With that said, an identification of regional crisis scenarios is a good starting point for good cooperation among member states. The increasing need for electricity systems to coordinate with their neighbours has been reflected in the recent EU electricity rules. Creating regional coordination structures is crucial for building the market design of the future. Since 2006, TSOs in continental Europe have developed forms of voluntary collaboration. In 2016, member states decided that this cooperation should become legally mandatory and created the regional security coordinators. We have seen the success of uh, what you have delivered in the clean energy package, which further strengthened the cooperation of TSOs. I count on your continued support to make this closer cooperation a success story. Let me be clear, these regional bodies are there to complement, not to substitute national DSOs. National DSOs will still continue to play a key role for system security. Coming from Estonia, I know how especially important this coordination is in the Baltic context. Synchronization with Continental Europe Network by 2025 is key to ensure secure, affordable 
and sustainable energy. And I'm happy to say that the synchronization is progressing well towards a targeted date. The Commission is uh, fully committed to providing considerable technical and financial support for this common European goal. And to get us there, it is all the more important that the three Baltic countries act jointly when it comes to ensuring safe grid operation. I also want to talk about digitalization. It holds so much promise for the energy sector. Even so, it's not without its challenges. Access, trust and interoperability are prerequisites for data to flow in a simple, safe and secure way. In the energy market, access to data means different things for different stakeholders, but the aim is in all cases is um, seamless and secure data exchange. The new electricity directive ex explicitly states that member states must put in place transparent, non-discriminatory rules for access to data, as well as ensuring data protection and the impartiality of the entities that process data. At the same time, we know the intersection of digitalization data and interaction with dis distributed resources requires a very big change in the way of working for DSOs and TSOs. We have invested around 1 billion euros to support R&I in smart grids in Horizon 2020. In 2018, 2019 and 2020, we invested 100 million euros to support the development and application of digital technologies in the energy system. Cybersecurity is another challenge for, for digitalization. Cyber attacks are considered by the electricity sector to be amongst the top priority risks to address. In the energy sector, these are particularly relevant due to the real-time requirements, cascading effects and the mix of legacy technologies with smart and state-of-the-art technology. And so, the Clean Energy Package sets out specific provisions on cybersecurity for the, for the electricity sector. Meanwhile, the Security Union strategy adopted by the Commission in July 2020 responds to both internal and external threats. It puts forward new rules to protect and increase the resilience of the physical and digital infrastructures, providing key services to society in different sectors. This strategy also highlights the need for sector-specific actions in energy. A network code on the cybersecurity of cross-border electricity flows is planned for the end of 2021. This work builds on the Commission recommendation on cybersecurity in the energy sector. Finally, let me touch on renewable offshore energy. This is a top of my mind because um, just last week we adopted a, a new EU strategy on this. Europe is the leader in offshore wind and is the home to the largest operational wind farms. Europe has the potential to realize up to 3,400 terawatt hours of offshore wind energy within its waters in 2030. The higher and more constant wind speed at sea means that offshore wind energy can help Europe's ambition to become number one in renewables. The countries around the Baltic Sea joined the Baltic Sea Offshore Grid Initiative in September to boost energy independence and reduce carbon emissions. With the offshore renewable energy strategy, the Commission will propose ways to build up a comprehensive enabling framework supporting the step-up and long-term development of this economic and industrial sector with its strong potential for sustainable and inclusive growth, jobs and global leadership. Dynamic development of offshore wind in the Baltic Sea can support the recovery of national economies after the slowdown we are seeing due to the coronavirus pandemic. We also know that an efficient grid able to convey on land the huge amount of energy generated by wind, solar and ocean is key for the development uh, of the offshore sector. Grid technologies must be able to provide solutions 
to the stability and security of supply risks de deriving from more renewables. The grid infrastructure can evolve from the point-to-point -point connection used today to more complex configurations including multi-terminal, high-voltage direct current, energy hubs, etc. Ladies and gentlemen, these issues are what I see as the most pressing challenges for the future of the power sector. But no doubt, with greater cooperation, as you are demonstrating with your discussion today, we will overcome them. Thank you and enjoy the conference. Thank you, Commissioner Simpson, for giving us this bird's eye view from Brussels. Now I would like to give the floor to the President of European Network Transmission System Operators for Electricity, Mr. Hervé Lafay, for his welcoming speech. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished speakers and high-level representatives, dear colleagues and friends. It is my great pleasure to give you some words in the opening conference of this conference, and I am delighted to see the number of the participants connected and by the program, given the quality of speakers who accepted this invitation. This Baltic RSC conference is a fourth RSC event. The series started in Munich with TSC in 2017, moved to Brussels with Corezo in 2018, and then to Copenhagen last year with the Nordic RSC in 2019. In my eyes, the birth of the TRSC is a success story of innovation in the TSO community. Not that the regional cooperation started with them. There is a long tradition of regional cooperation and beginning with the 24-7 connection between operators in the control centers. The regional centers correspond to a response, thanks to technological possibilities, to new or growing challenges which requested an intensification of this cooperation, no longer sufficiently based on bilateral telephone calls or digital links. Let's have a look back on history, and history is telling this success story. Regional security coordinators have been firstly established across Europe thanks to a spontaneous initiative by the TSOs. It started on the smallest possible size, with Tana and RTE setting up a desk in Milano with two persons after the Italian blackout. Then it continued more than 10 years ago with TSC Net and Corezo for Central Europe, Nording RSC in Scandinavia, SCC in the Balkans, and last but not least, Selene CC for Southeast Europe. And Baltic RSC, which is hosting this conference despite exceptional circumstances created by the pandemic. Tavi will tell us later more about this RSC. So today we are talking about a new step in regional cooperation for a more resilient operation every second. And the pandemic indeed reminds us every day of the importance of maintaining the security of electricity supply. The European power system is in full transformation and is facing new or transmuted challenges. To put it in very simple words, the impact of this transformation is shifting the local vs global balance. With two different, complementary and coexisting huge changes. In the vertical dimension, with more and more generation embedded in, in the distribution networks and even going down to the customer level when it comes to potential flexibility services. And the horizontal dimension, with for instance the offshore hundreds of gigawatts to be installed far away from the existing networks and consumers. These two changes in the power system have huge consequences on the flows in both dimensions and hence on the capacity of the infrastructure to wheel these flows and on the capacity of the operators to have the instantaneous balance between generation and consumption. Since and the size of the pan-continental flows are increasing from the northeast to Italy, 
the need of focal centers in order to be more efficient in the cooperation with a nodal organization of the, of the cooperation. They are not a substitute of national control centers that are facing the growing need of local interaction with local stakeholders, distribution and generation, with the need to maintain a local footprint for many reasons, starting with language, local legislation, etc. So I'd like to talk about a network of regional centers because they have also to develop the necessary links between them from real-time operation to operational planning. And this joint conference with a rotating host among them is highly symbolic. RSCs are both adaptive to regional needs and to the evolution of the power system and forming a new grid layer, increasing resilience. Quite fortunately, technological solutions are facilitating this upgrade of the necessary digital layer on top of the physical infrastructure as well as an acceleration of innovation. RSCs operate sophisticated IT tools to address an operational coordination issue. The most recent examples are the launch of a short-term adequacy and LTH planning tools. The Common Grid Model project led by ENSOE should be released next year. As we will see with one of the next speakers, we are also looking at ways to use open source to allow more harmonized tools to be developed and adapted to regional needs. Let me now develop three of the numerous challenges that the TSOs and the RSCs are facing due to this digitalization transformation. The first one is transparency, yes, the transparency on data. Uh, TSOs are making a lot of data available in a transparent way through the transparency platform and our tenure network development plans, etc. So the first issue is about transparency. The second one is about interoperability. Digitalization is both a chance because of the flexibility of software layers and a challenge in terms of interoperability, hence the relevance of what will be presented on the open source initiatives of our sector. And lastly, of course, cybersecurity. The issue of data availability closely linked to the issue of cybersecurity, the creation of the digital new di digital layer also implies to reinforce our resilience to cyber attacks. And so it is already working together with DSOs and national and European agencies on cybersecurity on the drafting of a new cybersecurity network code. Of course, the RSCs are closely associated to this development. I would also like to stress that with these startups, we are also creating new, highly skilled jobs in Europe. And in these places, we also favor the mixing of study engineers and operators coming from the different TSOs, and this reinforces the capacity for cooperation in the future and the cross fertilization through the sharing of best practices. So, in my eyes, and we, you won't be surprised because we cherish them as the children of the TSOs, they are ex an example which allows to counter the image too often given to the TSO. This is all about high technology and agility. Because of the DNAs and regional footprint, it is no surprise to me that even to deliver similar, similar services, the solutions chosen by the stakeholders sometimes differ substantially from one RRC to another. In a way, they are both in cooperation and also in competition, competition in innovation, in best technology in, in integration and so on. And as far as it is working, I do not see any need to go further in trying to standardize the solutions. As I said, it allows a fair emulation between them and also certainly increases the resilience of this operational layer. RSCs are key elements of Europe's power system future. Creating a strong network among them is key also to ensure the pan-European energy and digital transition. TSO cooperation in regions and at the European level in NSOE is bringing benefits to Europe and its citizens, including when it comes to make, making the power system more resilient 
accelerating innovation and digitalization. As Joachim will present for those who have not attended our webinars on the so-called ENSOE 2030 vision, we are moving towards a true system of systems that will benefit all customers and citizens in the framework of the energy policies now clearly inspired by holistic challenges such as the Paris Agreement on Climate. In this system of systems, the TSOs and the association and so we are fully committed to play their role in enabling these sometimes difficult transitions. And the pandemic crisis, from which we have this chance to be on a sector economically quite preserved, enhances our duty to actively participate to the recovery plans. I thank again the Baltic RSC for giving us the opportunity to discuss how to achieve this together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hervé. We have time for a few questions and, dear friends, I do kindly remind you to post your questions to Slido using the event code RSC2020. And I actually see we have received a few questions already, Hervé. Uh, let's start with the first one. Uh, how do you see the cooperation between RSCs evolve in the future? Yeah, good morning to everybody. Um, well, I, I said it, I, th I, I think, already. I, I see an increase in the need of uh, more uh, cooperation and exchanges between the, the, the RACs. Um, it's, it's a similar story that we had between the TSOs. Uh, during the, the, the last decades, the exchange of data, the exchange also of best practices has been continuously progressing and it will be the same for the RACs. I, I'm certain of that. Uh, with regards to services, our next um, uh, question goes, do you think that we should go towards more harmonization or more standardization? And how do you ensure that the specificities of each region are still taken into account? Uh, I already mentioned that also. In my view, uh, what uh, the need to, to standardize is a need of services which are, which are delivered by the RSCs. After that, it, it, it belongs to the stakeholders, given the local uh, specificities, to decide what, what are the best solutions. And this um, could appear as a drawback, but to me it's also a benefit because with that, the number of different experiences is growing and certainly if they learn from each other, everyone will, will, will get benefit from that. And again, not having the same eggs in the same basket uh, increases generally the resilience to face uh, um, some events. We have a third question. Um, where, what are the areas that you think TSOs will benefit mostly from digitalization? I think that um, digitalization, it's, it's uh, mainly about first collecting more data and this, if, if we take the, the last experiences we had, for, for instance, so for a better forecasting of, of what will be the conditions in general of operation, this brings um, uh, a lot of, of uh, more uh, frequent and, um, and accurate data and this is one of the, of the uh, of the outcomes of uh, digitalization. And the other one also is, is to share more uh, what are the decision-aided tools that are used into, into these uh, either control centers at the national level or RSCs. There's one more question actually about those digital solutions. Do you actually see that the RSC level digital solutions could somewhat replace uh, TSO's systems, would there be a benefit of, of those common digital platforms? I think that there is room for both and that they are complementary. Okay? They, of course, the, as I said, there is this new layer, but uh, it doesn't, and I think that the Commissioner also, also um, said it, it doesn't uh, intend to substitute to the control center. So, they will, I would say, evolve in, in parallel with complementary services from one to, to the other. And, and this doesn't stop the need 
also to have uh, in connections between the, the the neighboring control centers at the, at the national level. So it's it's complementary and not not opposition between between these two these two challenges. Thank you so much, Hervé. Thank you for all the people posting questions. That's a wrap for now. Dear friends, I'm now pleased uh, to introduce our next speaker who will pave the way for our first panel. Please welcome Lucian Balea, R&D Program Director and Open Source Manager at RTE and Board Chair of LF Energy. Lucian will talk about a topic actually very close to my heart and that is open source. Hello, I'm Lucien and I'm very pleased to participate to the RSE conference. To briefly introduce myself, I'm with RTE, where I lead the open source program, and I'm also chair of the board of LF Energy, an open source foundation created in partnership with the Linux Foundation. LF Energy is dedicated to hosting the software needed by the power industry to keep pace with the energy transition. I will further talk about it during my presentation. So the aim of my talk today is to explain you why we believe that open source collaborations are the future of IT and tools for RSCs and TSOs. When people think about open source, they usually think about a generous license which has roots in a social movement aiming at promoted freedom in the cyberspace. This license allows several things such as access to the source code, free use, royalty-free redistribution, modifications, etc. But when we look at what open source has become today, we realize that the main actors of open source are the big high-tech companies. The reason is that these companies discovered that open source is an incredibly efficient model for collaborative software development. There is a common adage in the software business that one cannot get at the same time Good software delivered fast and cheap. Let's consider this from our perspective. We will need more and better software to manage efficiently a power system with increased complexity. This complexity is resulting from the growth of distributed renewable energy or from the emergence of new uses such as electric mobility and also from aging infrastructures that will require improved asset management practices. We need to develop this software fast to keep pace with the energy transition and European policies. And our software budget cannot inflate, unfortunately. In a nutshell, open source will allow to solve this equation. That's what the experience from other industries tells us. So how does it work? Well, when um, a software solution needs to be developed, most of the code is quite common with other users. And therefore, the effort to develop such common plumbing software can be shared with others. Doing so, one saves resources that can be refocused on more strategic developments. This business model has been successfully applied by other industries such as telecommunications, automotive, internet and cloud, and even movie production. In our TSO and RSC context, where regulations drive a convergence of practices and needs, the open source model seems to be even more relevant. Surprisingly, however, our industry is lagging behind. Two years ago, we had the opportunity to meet several major open source initiatives from other industries. The ONA project from the telecommunications was a convincing case. The story is the following. AT&T had to adapt the telecommunication network to the emergence of 5G, requiring a massive upgrade of communication capacities. They realized that instead of deploying physical equipment over the grid, as usual, it would be much more efficient to virtualize the network management functions and to deploy them as software on servers. However, they were not followed by their ecosystem in this vision, so they decided to build it in-house. But then they discovered that China Mobiles had the same vision, so they decided to join their forces 
under an open source collaboration, and they started the ONAP project in 2016. When we met them in 2018, they told us that it was a big success, as other carriers, such as Orange, Vodafone, Deutsche Telekom, joined the project. And the community gathered 2,500 developers. The project was delivering fast, and AT&T announced that it generated massive investment savings for them. So this case is interesting because not only it demonstrates how the good, fast, cheap equation could be solved, but also in the context of an old industry with legacy practices confronted to drastic changes in their environment. So it does not only apply for software companies, in fact. So far, we talked only about the leverage benefit from uh, sharing efforts. However, the open source initiative that we met told us that there were also other benefits, such as modularity and interoperability improvement. So better modularity comes from the fact that open source collaborations require to divide the big problem into smaller pieces in order to organize worldwide collaborations. Better interoperability is a result of openness. All the system can anticipate interoperability matters continuously during the life cycle of the project. Last, open source brings also benefits from a governance perspective. It reduces locking, and it also provides a known collaboration framework that is fast to implement or join. There is no need to spend months or years in negotiating agreements on IP or governance clauses. All these characteristics will result in more innovation, increased cost efficiency and velocity, and this will be further reinforced by facilitated cross-industry collaboration. We strongly believe that it, this is an important point as no single company can gather all the competencies required to build the software needed tomorrow. And eventually this will result in flexible and scalable solutions. So how this model would apply to TSOs and RSCs? TSOs with similar needs could first join their forces to build joint open source technologies. But these technologies could also be built for European or regional services. And moreover, having the same components used both in European implementations and local ones can facilitate the convergence of practices. This model does not mean that TSOs or RSCs have to go for in-house development. They could also tender for IT services requiring the reuse of specific open source components. And the same model can apply to TSO-DSO joint services. And the community could also benefit from contributions from third parties. So I hope that I have convinced you about the power of open source collaborations. Then. The next question is how to do it efficiently. It's not only about putting code on the internet. One important aspect is to offer a governance framework that is attractive to the development of communities. That's the role of open source foundations, such as the Linux Foundation. They have been successful with many other industries and they have developed best practices. So we should not reinvent the wheel and that's the reason why we partner with the Linux Foundation to create LF Energy. There are already existing open source initiatives addressing RSC needs. Let's look at the, these three ones, for instance. So the first one, Operator Fabric, is a smart assistant for system operators. It implements a unique HMI concept to interact with various operational or coordination processes. It is, for instance, implemented in the Let's Coordinate solution that addresses RSC coordination services. Besides RT, the Dutch DSO Aliander is also working on operator fabric with the aim to use it as a reference HMI for their system operations. So the operator fabric is hosted at LF Energy, as you can see on the logo. The second project, also hosted at LF Energy, is possible. It stands for Power System Blocks. It provides grid modeling and grid calculation components that can be used in power system simulation and study platforms, from real-time security analysis to grid planning. 
Another interesting project is a CGMES OCL validator tool that has been built by ENSOE and RTE. The code is available under an open source license at the link provided here. So LF Energy started in 2019 and the community is expanding fast today, both in terms of project portfolio and members. Currently, Aliander and RT are the main members, but also other TSOs are joining and increasing their participation. We can already see that Ellering and Tenet are general members of LF Energy, and there should be some announcements in the coming days with others, uh, other Uplan TSOs joining LF Energy as general members. So I would like to invite the RC and TSO community to follow up on investigating opportunities related to power system security challenges. Thank you for your attention. You can browse the LF Energy website at the link below if you want to learn more about LF Energy, open source and existing projects. And please reach out to me to investigate further open source collaborations and opportunities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucien. I'm intrigued by the open source principle and uh, so are intrigued by many of uh, people in our audience who have posted questions. Thank you very much, dear friends. Uh, just a kind of reminder, you can post your questions to Slido and I'm going to take as many as I can. There's quite a few to Lucien here. Uh, first question, what is the maximum potential of open source, if there is any, and uh, to what scale can it be implemented in the RSC services, well taken into account security and other specifics of RSCs? Great question. So the, uh, is there a limit to the potential? That's uh, something that is um, difficult to answer because when we look at what has been done by other industries with uh, very huge technologies that are developed in an open source uh, manner, uh, we realize that the potential can, can be very big. Uh, the ONAP project um, is, 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 um, that I mentioned during my presentation is a convincing case to us because this, this system is intended to uh, run the telecommunication uh, grid and, and handle 5G communications for all those big carriers that are uh, huge in industries. There are many other examples. Um, I briefly mentioned the, the uh, movie industry. They uh, decided to collaborate on all the tools that they use for their visual uh, effects in, in, the big, uh, in the big movies, big uh, uh, movie productions. Um, when we look at what Google or Microsoft are, are doing, it's um, so I don't, um, I don't see a limit, so it's not restricted to some some small small things, uh, small geek things. I, I would say. Now, um, regarding um, the application of open source uh, software development to uh, TSO and RSC needs, and also considering uh, uh, our um, requirements in terms of security, etc. We have to realize that all our critical systems are uh, running on uh, the Linux uh, operating system, Linux kernel, and this is developed in, in open source. Um, there are um, the, the critical infrastructure for, for, for uh, telecommunications is using open source. So, um, and, uh, and also another interesting example is um, the the French National Cybersecurity uh, Agency uh, is developing a, a secured operating system from the, for the French administration. And um, I think two years ago, maybe two or three years ago, they decided to open source this uh, operating system. And I discussed with them and, and, and they told us that um, uh, with openness, it's um, easier to, to handle cybersecurity because everybody can look and check. When, when codes are closed, there, there can always be suspicion. So um, from this perspective, I will not conclude that open source is better. I think open source can offer ways to improve 
uh, cyber security. And, and there are uh, uh, real examples uh, demonstrating that. Well, definitely open source has, has great benefits, but uh, what do you think, uh, why hasn't open source become, well, let's say very widely spread uh, in the energy sector yet? Um, another good question. I think um, it's it's maybe uh, there can be several reasons. Um, it's maybe also a, a matter of context and, and time. Uh, other industries have been pushed by um, external factors. They needed to adapt uh, to a changing environment, and um, in our case, maybe the. Um, so the, the, the systems were quite uh, stable in, in, in the last decade. It's changing for, uh, for, uh, since, since the last decade, and, and now we have um, many things to do to, to, to adapt our practices. But uh, uh, I guess currently the, the context is, is uh, more favorable to think about um, other ways that are more efficient to build our uh, software and to keep pace with the uh, the, the dynamics of the uh, energy transition and, and regulations. Um, it also implies um, a cultural change uh, because uh, with open source um, you need openness and also you need um, uh, not to control everything. So these initiatives are, are, are based on, on uh, there are voluntary initiatives based on meritocracy, so so less, less control. So there is a cultural change there. Um, but I think it's it's worth uh, the benefits. What about security concerns? I mean, I still think many might have, and maybe it's prejudice, uh, but the idea that if you have an open source platform, if it's uh, free to look at for anyone on the internet, you might get security concerns. You might get hackers attacking those critical infrastructure systems. Is this also something that needs a generational shift, or are these concerns somewhat uh, true? Um, so, first of all, I think that uh, we can expect that there will be more people uh, looking uh, at uh, this code and this software with uh, good intentions and people with uh, that will look at it with, with bad intentions. So um, that also means that um, indeed uh, so somebody could find a, a flaw uh, in the source code, but um, openness can increase reactivity to, to correct uh, those, uh, those flaws. And, and from that perspective, I think it's it's good uh, for cyber security. Um, then, um, when we talk about open source, we, um, we are not saying that everything will be disclosed. Uh, so there will be some uh, code uh, uh, available uh, and disclosed, but all of the uh, uh, secrets for config uh, configuration, etc. Uh, will be kept closed. So, so there, there are ways to um, uh, protect IT systems. And, and uh, I guess the, the best uh, answer is, is the, what happens in practice. Um, the, the Linux operating system is considered secure. Uh, we are using it for critical uh, applications. Uh, so that's demonstrate that when there is um, a community, a vibrant community that uh, works together to, to improve the, the security of um, uh, open source software, uh, there are significant improvements. Um, and there are also uh, um, examples of uh, cyber attacks targeting proprietary software, and, and, and they were, which were successful. So um, closing the software, the, the experience shows that closing the source code is not a way to protect us uh, against cyber security threats as well. 
there's quite a technical question uh, next. Uh, power system simulation tools are very service provider heavy with large names offering uh, software. If and how could open source have access to that field? So, uh, indeed, the, the um, very good question, and the question is what, what will be the role of um, uh, software providers in an open source model? And what we answer to this question is that um, although open source collaborations allow us to develop the common plumbing uh, code, um, this code is, is not uh, usable as is, and uh, we, we cannot download just download it on, on internet and, and use it. Uh, because as industrials, uh, we need um, support uh, services, maintenance services. We need to be sure that if there is an issue, we can ask somebody to, to correct it. And uh, this requires technical mastership. That means that um, either all TSOs get those competencies internally, which may not be the most efficient, or we will need software uh, companies that will provide us uh, those services. And they will do so because uh, they are involved in, in the technical projects, because they, they can uh, make the changes, improvements, corrections that are needed, etc. Et um, so um, then the, the next question is, uh, so why do we need uh, open source um, code um, in that respect? I think that there are indeed um, a lot of, uh, there are many software available, grid calculation software available. Now, when we, there is a regulation changing, when we need to, to implement um, a new format such as the CGMES, when we need to, to adapt those uh, grid calculation tools to new processes, new needs. Uh, is, it, is the current situation consisting in asking all the providers to implement those changes the most efficient? I, I think it's not the case because uh, the cost is, is, is paid several times. Uh, each time it, it, it takes time and then we result with um, uh, difficult uh, um, interoperability issues. So although they, are, they have the main standards, uh, software from different vendors can have some differences and, and, and this is also time consuming. So having um, an open source collaboration on, on a joint uh, uh, technology that is then re-implemented by, by all the vendors into their uh, solutions would be the um, most efficient way, way forward. There's another technical question. Uh, can we get open licenses onto the data sets too? Uh, a big issue for, among others, energy system modelers working on public policy. There are open source um, licenses uh, as well. Applied to uh, open data sets. These licenses are a bit different because those uh, used for open source are dedicated to, to source code and they are a bit specific, but there exist also uh, licenses for share and um, allowing pooling data from um, values, uh, um, to, to, to make a uh, a bigger that database and increase the uh, possible applications. Um, so yes, indeed, um, there are different concerns regarding data sets that, that need to be solved because sometimes the one who uh, owns uh, the, the the one who who, who um, um, generates the data and owns the data is different from the one that that can provide it. Uh, so there are specific uh, concerns relating to that, but um, uh, I agree that um, improving openness in data is also something that would uh, uh, reinforce the innovation capacity uh, of our data. So that's also another important 
Lucien, thank you for bearing with us. We have uh, two more questions for you. Uh, open source community is supporting on Linux Foundation, as you said. Now, do you see a need for European society on open source? So there are several foundations, open source foundation that uh, exist today. The, um, the Linux Foundation is the uh, most important one in terms of uh, volume uh, and, and the software hosted. Um, there are also um, European foundations such as uh, the Eclipse Foundation uh, decided to move uh, uh, to Europe uh, um, this year. I, I think it was uh, around the, the summer or, or maybe uh, before the summer. Um, there are other uh, foundations such as OW2 that is also a European foundation. When I mean European or, or, or North American, is the, depending on the where the um, the foundation is, is established. Now, what we need to understand is that, uh, despite the fact that uh, Eclipse is, is established in Brussels and the Linux Foundation in San Francisco, those foundations have a global perspective. So uh, they. Um, they gather communities and projects with a global perspective in mind. So for instance, there are projects, uh, sub-foundations at the Linux Foundation for which the center of gravity is in Asia, uh, around Japan, for instance. And regarding LF Energy today, the center of uh, gravity is, is um, more in Europe, uh, for instance. Uh, what is also important to, to understand is that um, the open source license is uh, understood worldwide and, and it gives a uh, lot of uh, security and flexibility in terms of um, non-dependency because uh, despite the fact that the project is, is hosted at one place of the world or the other, the open source license allow uh, a party uh, in, in Europe to get the code and to uh, reuse it and to build another collaboration if tomorrow uh, uh, the uh, framework is uh, the, the, the governance framework is, is not sustainable. Uh, what else should I say? So why do we need to choose this foundation or the other one? I, I think the foundation have decided to specialize themselves on, on certain topics. So uh, on our case, uh, we we want to, 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 to use this, the opportunity to, to work with the foundation that are the most advanced on a certain topic, and especially the energy one. Lucien, we have one last question for you. Um, a very practical question. Uh, how, do, uh, how to start with an open source uh, today when you're a TSO or a RSC? It's a um, good question. It's, it's a journey. So um, it, it's a journey. When we started uh, considering open source at RT, first it was for uh, transparency considerations. And then we discovered uh, um, uh, what other industries are, are doing. We understood how licenses work and what does it mean in terms of uh, compliance. Um, then we um, uh, launched a collaboration with the Linux Foundation to create LF Energy. We also created um, an internal open source program office at RT. That is, uh, that is not a big, uh, it's not a big team. It's just uh, one person, uh, uh, me, and, and uh, I work with a network of people inside the existing organization to uh, make sure that we adapt our uh, practices, software development practices, procurement practices, etc., to the uh, open source strategy. So it's, it's a journey, um, but we are lucky that there are other industries that are more advanced than us and they paved the way and there is a lot of material available um, to, um, to understand what, uh, how, how we should organize uh, ourselves. There was a, a great LF Energy conference uh, on that aspect uh, hosted at Alliander um, in, in uh, March, I think this year, March or April this year. I can provide the links to the uh, recordings and, and, and materials uh, 
uh, if, if people want to learn more about that. Well, that'd be wonderful. Thank you so much, Lucien. Thank you for all the people Thank posting you. those uh, wonderful and somewhat technical questions. I'm pretty sure this uh, keynote helped us really understand the benefits of open source. Thank you. Now, dear friends, time to kick off our first panel um, on the role of data to support power system security. Now, this panel will be moderated by Tahir Kapetanovic, chair of the ENSO E-System Operator Committee. Before I hand over the floor, let's actually look at a video to remind us what is it that regional security coordinators or RSCs really do. Let's start at the beginning. I don't suppose you remember what you were doing on the 4th of November 2006 at 10 past 10 p.m. The European Electricity Transmission System operators do. Did someone touch something? What's happening? What's causing the outage? Is it regional? National? We need to resynchronize the grid. Hurry up! A blackout plunged more than 15 million homes into darkness for nearly two hours. This event demonstrated the need for greater coordination between the various TSOs. As such, the various stakeholders looked for ways to improve operational coordination to ensure security of supply. Uh, how can we do this? Oh, well, here, just take it. N no, I can't. Oh. As a result of this willingness to better coordinate and share information, the first two RSCs were created in 2008, Cariso and TSC. These were followed a year later by the association ENSO-E, which brings together European TSOs. The family then grew with the creation of RSC-SCC for Southeast Europe in 2015 and Baltic RSC and Nordic RSC in 2016. There, there's no longer a risk of a shortage. 42 transmission system operators now share their information with RSCs to provide a broader overview of electricity sharing in Europe. Yes, but what exactly do they share? Specifically, each TSO publishes its computer model, which is the dynamic representation of its electricity grid. It's called an IGM. Yes, an individual grid model. RSC engineers receive various IGMs from TSOs. Then they merge these IGMs to create a CGM. Ah, the famous common grid model. Representing the electricity grid at European level. RSCs can provide this service a year in advance, a week in advance, a day in advance, or several times a day. All European TSOs then have the same accurate overview of flows on high voltage lines so that they can study behavior and guarantee security. The CGM is the basis for most of the RSC processes. Oops! Ma well, did warn you. Oh, never mind. Dear friends, as we're trying to get uh, a good connection with Tahir, I'm going to take over uh, moderating uh, this panel. And um, it's my pleasure to um, uh, well, welcome all, uh, all the participants here, both the ones virtually present, but also uh, um, my friend here physically present uh, with me here in this studio that can get quite lonely sometimes. Without a further introduction, uh, dear friends, um, let's, uh, let's start with the first uh, question. Now, um, how do you think data could actually support system security these days? A delicate issue, right? We have all the data in the world available, but uh, is it actually secure in our critical systems? You can start here. Welcome. It's uh, nice to keep uh, definitely two meters distance with everybody. It's, um, but regardless, good morning and uh, welcome from Estonia. Regarding data and uh, system security, uh, I was thinking about... Uh, it's 2020. I'm 30 years old. I was born in 1990. These years are somehow symbolic. And to keep with symbolic numbers, I have two kids, and one of them is one year old. And by the time he's 2050, he will be my age. So achieving carbon neutrality by 2050 is very visible or personal in the, in the amount that it, there's no time to do it. In the time that my kids will start their careers, we will need to have changed everything in our society. How, how we power, how we heat, how we move, everything. And it's up to all of us, I suppose, to consider how likely we see that change as being. 
And that is certainly the reason we are, most of us or many of us, certainly the younger ones in the energy industry are working and that's what we're working towards. And at the end of the day, that's why we have the systems we have. But what gives me hope in this journey, not to lose hope, is that people are starting to care. If you ask people on the street, they are beginning to care and understand that it's an important problem and it's becoming reflected in our policies. What we're, what we're perhaps not so good at doing in the energy industry is communicating the vision of how we will get there, what we have to do and where will we be. And there's a role for, for TSOs that we can do better and for RSCs. But before I get to the data topic, let me share some, some thoughts of, of at least my personal vision in the Baltic region. We will have in 2050 a power system that depends essentially on production from offshore wind and local photovoltaic and local household level production. In the area of offshore wind, we will hear later today also about the initiative to connect neighboring countries via the sea with the HVDC lines. So th certainly that's one of the areas where RSCs will become more and more physically connected together. Uh, this, this physical connection to our neighbors will continue to increase. So power plants in our neighboring countries are equally good for security as they are in our own soil. And there's a role for RSCs to make that happen. In the area of uh, photovoltaics in households at the end of the day, that's an area we need to improve. There, there's, uh, in Estonia today already, uh, 400 megawatts of solar, which doesn't perhaps sound much to larger countries, but that can be one third of our peak demand in summer. So already one third of production in the summer is sort of blind to the TSO. We are supposed to operate the uh, power system in the RSC level, but we don't even see what's going on. So there's lack of data. We don't know where the solar is, and we cannot therefore operate our grid properly. So there's a lack of data for system security, and these problems need to be solved, and there's good progress on that as well. But also, when we're talking about the future vision, then Ellering, the TSO of electricity and gas in Estonia, we are very we believe the solution is with energy markets. We believe in, in the markets to solve the climate issues economically. And before I joined Ellering, I started a demand response aggregator and this is still going strong. There's about 30 people and they're operating in several countries. And that experience gave me, on a very grassroots level, a, a reason to believe in markets. So in 2017, FinGrid, opened the FCRD market, so the primary frequency reserve market for disturbances, for the first time for demand response. At that time, at Simpower, we were three guys with an idea, and we were straight out of university. We had no experience in the energy sector. The market opened, and three months later, we had 100 megawatts of FCRD that, we, that is still being provided to Fingrid. So I've seen from my first-hand experience that if you open up markets, the solutions come like this. There's, I personally have experienced how easy it is to bring flexibility to the markets. And if the price signal is there, solutions will follow. So we're talking about the future vision for data. We need transparency so that innovators can access the markets. We need coordination across, across countries. And that's what RSEs do. But being, being slightly more concrete in our vision for the RSC for regional coordination, our vision for that is that it will be a digital platform. And what do we, what do we mean by that? Uh, we mean that system operation will depend on data sharing around Europe, but the decisions will be made locally. The local decisions are informed by local expertise of how our grid is here, plus the data and information of what our neighbors are doing. That is the optimal way to operate a grid in the future with lots of renewables. And being also in Estonia, we have, a, we have from the past a, uh, an example of uh, centralized control. So during the Soviet times, there was a um, northeastern uh, grid control room in Riga, and that's where they operated the whole regions. So we, we have experience with centralized power system operation. Sure, it can work, but there's issues. It's, it does not produce the optimal results everywhere and it's not transparent. So we were talking about innovators having access to, to providing the solutions then if you're centrally controlled then it's harder to achieve that. Our faith and we believe that the best way forward is 
coordination with digital tools. And that's made possible with today's technology, which wasn't possible 30, 40 years ago. We can share data centrally, but we can make decisions locally. And also I'm very happy that we had uh, the keynote from Lucien about open source, because that is a final piece of the picture. So if we are we're sharing data, make decisions locally, but we're using the same software tools to do it, then that is the secret sauce for power system operation on a European level that gives us maximum security of supply with market transparency at low cost and a carbon-free grid. Thank you so much, Georg, for getting the conversation started. Uh, I was very rude not to introduce our other panelists uh, before, as I had to rush right onto to the stage now, quite uh, unexpectedly. Here. Yeah, we also have Patty Hayes, uh, the Managing Director of uh, ESP Networks, and we also have Uwe Zimmermann, Managing Director of uh, TSC Net Services. And we also now have the real moderator uh, of this panel, Tahir <laughs> Kapetanovic, online with us. Tahir, welcome back. Uh, I'm going to give you uh, the panel yeah, now. Yeah, thank you. So I think, uh, yeah, thank you. I hope you can hear me now and uh, we have to do some technical issues. But thank you, Gerard, for your answering the question and also for providing us a statement which uh, was uh, foreseen for you in this first part. Behalf on this four, uh, uh, my predecessor already is about our panelists. So Georg is there. We also have Paddy Hayes. Dear friends, uh, I do apologize for the little technical difficulties that we have. The networks uh, are challenged these days when uh, people are making their uh, online. Uh, events all over the world. Uh, I would like to um, hand over the floor to uh, Uva first to, to answer this, this first question. Uh, how do you think data could support system security, Uva? Yes, how, how, how the data can support um, system security. Um, and first of all, a very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm more speaking about, sort of say, the content of the data uh, rather than the technology behind. Um, so, and if I if I would like to uh, or introduce the uh, the role of uh, the RSC, it's more like a navigation system for the TSOs. Why the TSOs are more or less the car driver, and as a car driver, you need um, a, a good forecast, so to say, on the routes. Whether they are route blockers, uh, you need actual traffic data in the end. Um, you can um, uh, trust uh, the, um, the recommendation of the navigation system, but at the same time, you need to look on the traffic for yourself, because uh, if there's a blocked route and that's what's not forecasted, then you need to take action on a local level, like the TSOs do that. Um, so from the perspective of um, uh, how the data can support um, the system security, um, I would say, as it was also um, uh, mentioned in the uh, in, this, in the movie up front, um, what we need is a good um, description of the transmission infrastructure uh, and all the data that are linked with that, including also locations of consumption and generation. If we have this available, more or less, we all have we have all at hand in order to make a good um, forecast and a recommendation to the TSOs. Um, Today, we have the situation from a legal perspective that more or less everything is settled uh, in terms of the, the legislation. So even the, um, uh, the data are defined and also the, uh, the providers are sufficiently um, obliged uh, to, uh, to provide the information. Uh, so in the end, if we really speak about the practical usage of all the data, it's then more about uh, the, uh, the data accuracy, the timely update after data are changing, uh, and also the impact on the security and the coordination the RSCs are about uh, to uh, to bring forward to the TSOs, uh, because uh, everyone should should know that uh, trading, for example, in the electricity market will not stop during the time the RSCs are doing the security assessment. Um, if we if we look on the the entire system. Um, we also see that uh, 
a bulk of this first generation is now already connected to the DSO grids and this amount might further increase uh, during the course of the energy turnaround. Uh, but those data are often not directly visible for the TSOs, neither the RSC. Um, and we all, as an RSC, we only can look on the TSO's real-time data we get provided in order to check the quality of our coordination service. Um, and, um, and in the end, um, we uh, cannot trace back uh, potential quality gaps uh, to coordination uh, towards the relevant underlying data. Um, so uh, th this means uh, that um, we might get um, uh, higher importance on the uh, on the quality screening and the availability of the data uh, just to ensure uh, that we uh, do not have systematic risks in our in our forecasts um, on the other hand what we are currently uh, seeing as a challenge um, due, due to regulation uh, we are not only supposed to with a security assessment but we are also supposed uh, to provide remedial action proposals to the TSOs that are following quite sophisticated optimization approaches and methodologies. Um, and there's also the request that uh, TSOs should as best as possible uh, follow the recommendations the RSCs are putting forward. Uh, for meeting this objective, it's key in the end that a fast data flow is organized between the stakeholders in the in the network infrastructure in order to ensure a quick assessment of the security situation and the countermeasures uh, and also a fast decision making on all the levels that uh, that are affected. Today, we can say that um, at least if we plan on the previous day for the delivery on the next day, uh, we need several hours to come up with the security assessment and a proper proposal on the immediate actions to be implemented. Thank you so much. So, uh, I would like uh, to bring Norma, actually Paddy uh, in this service, conversation. Um, as RSCs will be significant. Thank you so much, Uva. If only internet was as stable as electricity, we would all live a much happier life. Uh, Paddy, uh, what is the status of the implementation of smart meters around Europe and uh, how will they, and also the data they produce, facilitate the achievement of uh, the great climate goals? Well, good, uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning from Ireland, uh, where it's, it's wet and windy this morning. So. And uh, not a lot of solar, but uh, but it's good for hydro and good good for uh, wind renewables. So first of all, could I say I uh, really appreciate the invitation to bring a distribution system perspective uh, to the panel discussion this morning. So um, both George and you have, have um, referenced the fact that we have a lot of uh, an increasing number of distribution connected generation um, on the uh, on the systems generally. So I think it's really um, uh, positive. Uh, that uh, distribution is, is being considered as part of this discussion. Um, as I said, uh, as, as you said, I'm, I'm the managing director of ESB Networks, uh, which is the DSO in Ireland. Um, but uh, I'm a, a board member of uh, the European uh, DSO Association, EDSO. And I currently have the honor to work alongside Michael Jesperger uh, from Transnet BV uh, as one of the co-chairs of the distribution uh, transmission cooperation platform in Europe. So that's supporting the important cooperative work uh, between NSOE and the four uh, European distribution associations, Geoda, SEDEC, Euroelectric, and of course, uh, EDSO. And uh, data and uh, data interoperability is, is one of the uh, key areas of, of cooperation between transmission and distribution. So just in, in relation to that uh, particular question about smart metering and how the data uh, uh, the data from smart metering can be supportive. So um, different parts of Europe are at very different stages in terms of their uh, rollout and deployment of, of smart metering. So for example, in Ireland, we're at a very, uh, very early stage. We have uh, smart meters in about 10% of the uh, locations so far and our uh, big systems uh, go live happens at the end of this year. But during our trials, we found 
that uh, the engaged households that were using smart metering, where they were getting that data and that information back themselves, we saw those households reducing their electricity consumption by 3%. And we also, and I think this is probably more important, we also saw their potential for shifting their power consumption and their power demand out of times of uh, peak demand and highest cost, which is usually correlated with highest carbon, into times of um, uh, low, you know, less peak demand or times where there was more uh, more wind blowing on the system. So we've seen a real potential in those uh, early trials, certainly in Ireland, for smart metering and the interaction of customers with the smart metering data to have a significant uh, impact and to be a significant part of the solution here and really letting every electricity customer uh, take play their own part in the in the energy transition. So in Ireland, we're lucky with lots of wind, um, but on the other hand, uh, we're, we are an island system. So uh, as a DSO, uh, ESB Networks works very closely with our uh, TSO, AirGrid. But other than our colleagues in Northern Ireland, uh, there aren't really strong interconnection links so far um, uh, from our island grid. And that means the challenge of uh, bringing uh, more renewables, intermittent renewables on the system and accommodating on the system is, is quite a high challenge. Um, but uh, in the first six months of this year, we were really proud to get uh, over 30% of uh, electricity in Ireland from renewables, which is a tremendous achievement for, for such a grid. And our, our target really is to get, if I take George's challenge, uh, where he's talking about the, uh, the, the fact that the, the younger people in the energy industry and electricity industry care about the future, uh, I can assure you, George, uh, the older people care as well. So our ambition really is to get to 70% by 2030, and that's going to require uh, real use of data and uh, collaboration, strong, strong, strong collaboration, not just between uh, TSO and DSO, but also between the DSO and that connected community that you and George were talking about, the people who are uh, consumers, prosumers, uh, the small distributed uh, generation, uh, aggregation and the and the provision of uh, flexibility and system services. So our estimate is that up to 60% of the system flexibility services are going to be required in Ireland over the next years to accommodate more renewables on the system. Up to 60% of those are likely to come from distribution connected um, uh, service providers. And in that way, uh, it's not just about um, smart metering, but it's also about uh, good uh, sharing and appropriate sharing of data between uh, DSO and TSO, of course, but also then between the other service providers and, and the DSOs. Thank you so much, Paddy. We're going to give one last chance for the networks that connect us to Tahir, uh, who should be with us now over the phone. Tahir, can you hear us? Yes, thank you. I'm sorry for these technical issues. I think it's normal these days. And thank you also for the covering the questions from the audience, which was the purpose of our panel. Uh, nevertheless, I mean, we have also answered quite a few of them. I see here on the screen there are five or six yet open. I'd still like maybe uh, the panelists, also thank you for introducing yourself. I don't think I need to do it again, um, to, to reflect on two of today's discussion. On one hand, this is the uh, regional security coordinators and data availability and coordination. And on the other hand, it's actually the topic of the conference. Uh, how can data, data exchange and data availability support climate goals by maintaining security? So maybe to start uh, in an opposite direction, maybe to start with Uwe. Uh, very, very short statement, Uwe, on these two points. Uh, coordination in RSC, data availability, and how this all relates to climate change. Maybe two or three minutes, and then we go back to the questions from the audience. So let's start with Uwe, please, first. Um, link it with climate goals uh, changes. So uh, this requires a long-term perspective. Uh, what we see today is that more, uh, more and more dispersed generation uh, is is in place and will also be more in place in the future. Uh, so this means that um, the um, the need uh, to uh, have um, um, the data provided uh, via all the levels that are. Um, um, providing to the electricity market uh, that they, so to say, are well um, um, 
collected and put together so that uh, that in the end we can come forward with uh, a good security coordination. Um, in in the long run, um, uh, we have some challenges. At least today, uh, our our job is based on the assumption that uh, we can uh, forecast and predict the system. Um, and the more volatility we will get in, in the system, uh, we also might expect that also the market would react with providing more flexi flexibility in order to, uh, to cope with uh, this volatility. Um, but at the same time, it's a, it's a kind of a natural antagonist to predictability. So we see, uh, so to say, some challenge on our side that we uh, uh, can um, maintain the predictability of the system. In the end, this might lead to um, um, uh, of decisions to the length in time uh, when it can be done in order to keep the system stable. Because in the end, it's clear uh, that um, the volatility is um, a natural um, um, effect in the system and we need all uh, to, uh, to take care of it and to provide proper data exchange in order to be on top of uh, the security issues. On climate and RSCs, I mean, you are our key service providers and uh, RSCs today and RCC in the future are part of the so family and uh, enablers. How do you see this uh, on, on a regional level? Uh, what could be uh, better? What could be better in the next five or ten years when we have better insights, when we have better information and data exchange and the whole structure from the third package and the fourth package and the clear, uh, clean energy package really is implemented? How do you see this? The, the question goes in my direction, Tahir. Yes, again, because uh, you reflected on RSC situation and uh, on the data availability and exchange for RSC. And I was asking you additionally, how do you see the contribution from our uh, common cooperation, uh, short-term adequacy forecast, our regional alignment of uh, transmission business to our risk coordination and climate issues, uh, reduction of CO2, uh, change of generation mix, which we are all experiencing. Basically, I would say the, the, the climate change and CO2 reduction and renewables was the driving force behind LSCs anyway some 10 years ago. So how do you see the future here? What will be contributing? What we will all contribute to and how we will do this to, 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 to facilitate this process? I think we have a lot of instruments already uh, in place and uh, we are about to improve that further. So uh, the, normally the, uh, the operational planning horizon is not only one day or two days or one week or one month. So it's a, it's a longer time frame. And uh, while having implemented um, the tools and we call it services, like you mentioned, uh, the adequacy assessment, the capacity calculation, uh, but also the security assessment, we need to see and perceive it as a package uh, of uh, tools that, uh, that in the end will um, uh, help uh, the TSOs especially, uh, but also connected with, with, the, with the TSOs, the DSOs, because they also profit from a good uh, security cooperation uh, that um, uh, we commonly can prepare on a regional level for challenges to come. So if we uh, see clearly at, uh, at a certain early point in time, that um, a potential um, security issue might be in place half year later, so then we are, um, we are on top of it. Uh, this, of course, requires that we really follow all the, um, the implementation um, requirements we are um, now about to implement. Thanks a lot, Uwe. I see some interesting questions concerning even artificial intelligence. This is going to be interesting to answer in a moment, but let us give also now a chance to Paddy, if you would like so, to move from the RSC to the uh, view of distribution uh, system and uh, the, the, the maybe the place where most of renewable integration happens. How do you see the role of data and information coordination and climate goals? Uh, do we need it? And uh, how important and how uh, how challenging will it be in the next, say, uh, decade to, 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 to achieve these climate goals relying on appropriate data? So, Paddy, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks to hear. Um, we were speaking uh, 
really so far we spoke about the um, the connection and the accommodation of intermittent renewables onto the onto the network, and um, as you were saying, uh, the antagonistic effect that that might have on on stability. Um, so it's really important that we manage that. But uh, as as we look at the challenge, uh, we see this as not just one of accommodating uh, more um, flexible renewables onto the system, which is really important. Uh, we also see a real opportunity in going back to George's challenge for his children and his children's children. We see the challenge of then using that increasingly clean electricity uh, through the distribution system to enable and facilitate the electrification of heat and transport and industry and ultimately the economy and society. And that's uh, that's an equally um, serious uh, challenge for the distribution systems uh, to make sure that um, the, the distribution systems are fit for purpose there. And um, o over years, and this is different in different countries and different locations with different histories, uh, but over, over the years, the distribution systems, certainly at the low voltage level, have been uh, generally designed for a different purpose to that. They haven't been designed with electric vehicles in mind or with um, uh, with the idea that uh, there would be a lot of uh, auto generation or uh, provision of system services. So there's a, a real, um, there's a, a, a great transformation happening in the distribution uh, systems across Europe as uh, we're making sure that those uh, particularly low voltage syst uh, distribution systems where in some cases uh, we don't have a visibility of what's happening because they've been designed as passive systems that we make those active systems and that requires uh, visibility, uh, so it means monitoring visibility, and then it also means the management and control of those uh, systems uh, to uh, ensure to prevent uh, congestion and to maximize the uh, ability for the distribution system then to uh, make available uh, distribution connected system services or distribution connected uh, generation to the system. So there is a real uh, data um, transformation happening uh, particularly at the low voltage distribution uh, levels in uh, in many parts. And um, I think that's going to be absolutely key because it's not just about connecting renewables, which is really important, or about providing the uh, flexibility and syst distributed system services, which is equally important. Uh, but then it's also about making sure that the distribution system is capable of uh, feeding the electrification of heat transport uh, and industry. So in that mix, um, data uh, really comes to the fore and being in a position to manage low voltage systems in the same way as we manage medium and high voltage systems and manage transmission systems um, is going to be important. And then I take the point um, made by you earlier on, uh, across this integrated system between distribution and transmission, bearing in mind the, um, the frontier between the distribution system and um, the, all of the actors on the edge of the grid, whether they be aggregators, battery, uh, storage providers, um, generators, prosumers, bearing that in mind, making sure that then there's a coherent uh, understanding of what's happening um, and so that we can make sure that the system remains stable is going to be really important and data forms a key part of that. And so I'm, I'm delighted to see uh, when I look back at the um, interaction and the work between uh, transmission and distribution over a large number of years, but the increasing, the acceleration of that work um, in the areas of interoperability or convergence or, uh, or standards, uh, system operator guidelines and so on, um, because it's going to be really important. Um, and it's going to be part, I don't think, uh, don't think any of us know exactly how we're going to get, um, uh, you know, right up there to the very, very high levels of uh, renewable penetration yet, but we are going to get there. And it's a challenge for all of us, and uh, data is going to be right in the middle of it. Thanks a lot. Also, for answering questions I didn't ask you, I was just about to say, how do you value the DSO, DSO corporation? You have exactly pointed that we are actually living smart grid in its really utmost uh, meaning today and even more in the future. Before moving back to questions, uh, now, uh, Georg, uh, you've done already uh, your statement while answering the first question. But I'll ask you something else which we did not agree in advance, and this is you are digitalization manager at Ellering. In most of your souls, we have uh, your colleagues, 
in APG where I work, we have uh, the digitalization director. So what is what are the three most important challenges for you and your colleagues? Because before we have IT managers, uh, you know, and so on. Now we have, we call it digitalization. Now I was programming 40 years a computer. Everybody of us is long time in the business. What is really challenging for this digitalization for you today? Tell us three most important things, man. That's Sorry for a surprising question, but I hope you don't mind. <laughs> to make not it at more. all. That's, yeah. a, that's a great question. So it, it touches upon uh, all of us in, uh, in TSOs and RSEs and DSOs. The number one challenge is people. We, have, uh, we come from the past of a very different set of requirements for operating the grid. Uh, what we see at Ellering, uh, and it's uh, certainly true in RSCs, but uh, most TSOs and DSOs, that we have become IT companies. So over the last uh, months at Ellering, we have uh, fought very hard to stop thinking of uh, the IT organization and the rest of the organization. So the biggest challenge is, is, uh, is the legacy mindset of uh, treating IT like any other investment, but it's actually core business. It's what we do to keep the lights on. So that, that is uh, the mindset and plus the skills. Of course, we are all competing for, uh, for talent. Um, IT especially is, uh, is competing for talent and we can all agree on that. The third one, um, in light of today's conference, is cooperation. It doesn't make sense that the thousands of grid operators in, in Europe, uh, so, so 3,000 or so DSOs, 43 TSOs. In Europe alone, we are all building the same solutions again and again. We're not, we're not cooperating on that. So again, referring to open source approaches, uh, we, we have not made that happen yet. At Ellering also, we are still looking for that uh, very clear use case of what's the first open source project that really brings value to everyone. And there might be some in the pipeline uh, that will bring everybody on board. Because once we show that there's value in open source, we can do it cheaper and better and more securely, then we start changing the culture uh, from the bottom up like that. So it's uh, mindset, skills, and, and cooperation. Uh, that's, those are the three uh, top three challenges. Thank you. I think we all agree that talent is a key point. Now, you already touched upon one question. Let's come back to the list of questions from the audience. And this is one which says, uh, what are the areas or tools where open source could be used to benefit the digital cooperation, the coordination of RSEs? Can you very briefly, what would, I mean, you already touched upon it, but maybe to be a little bit more concrete, uh, where do you see that open source will help us in practice? Georg, yeah, maybe best to ask you, I think it's so in your domain. Certainly. So um, the, the answer to that is, uh, <laughs> the immediate answer is not very helpful because it's everywhere. I mean, uh, and let me be, and I will get more specific uh, in a second. But first, first of all, the philosophical approach that in any case, uh, what we're using, all of these, if you're not using Apple, then all the other smartphones we're using, that's all open source anyway. And, and even if you have proprietary software, like large parts of that is actually open source. So that's the first answer. That there's no limits to open source per se that can say where it is useful or not. Uh, now, the actual answer of what you're looking for is where it is useful first. Uh, and that's, that's a great question. So where, where can we immediately with our neighbors start collaborating to share open source tools? And, and I'd say most of the software in RSC world certainly can be, uh, and also outside of the RSC world. It really just depends on where do you, where do, does our company have the same problem as other companies but we are not competing on this problem, this sort of the pump plumbing or the piping. And there are some great initiatives uh, by RTE into uh, control room uh, tools, uh, even for system operation, uh, that are open source tools. So, and there's initiative from uh, uh, uh on the data hub side coming out. So there's several um, initiatives that can be useful, but at the moment uh, they're all uh, still uh, without the proper community. Uh, and uh, so those those things where uh, where uh, we have common problems are where we need open source tools. All right, thank you. I think it's really important to have more exchange and information flow about uh, good practices. All right, let's move to again a more practical question, really a concrete one. Um, it's about smart meters, and maybe I would address it to you, Paddy. 
the, the question is, what is the status of the implementation of smart meters around Europe? And how will they and the data they produce facilitate the achieve, achievement of plus and low? So uh, how and where and uh, whether the smart metering, smart meters, will help us? They provide myriads of data. They are rolling, being rolled out. How is the real situation in the field? That is. So, uh, Tahir, um, I, I, I addressed that question uh, while, while you were disconnected, but just uh, very, very briefly, uh, it's, it's very different from um, uh, different uh, country to country. Uh, the level of, uh, in some, some areas, uh, smart metering is, is fully up and running and has been for many years for, for all customers. In others, uh, like ourselves, uh, the smart metering penetration is at about 10%, so just in the first year of a five-year rollout, uh, rollout program. But um, as, as I mentioned earlier, one of the keys of smart metering is really giving uh, customers uh, the ability to play their part in the energy transition. So we saw in our trials in Ireland, uh, customers able to reduce engaged customers with smart metering, their own smart metering information, able to reduce, reduce their electricity demand by 3%, and as I said earlier on, more importantly, they had the ability to phase shift their demand uh, into times when uh, there was more wind generation or when prices were lower, um, when, uh, when uh, the carbon intensity of generation was lower. And so that's a really, really significant component. If that can be replicated then uh, across the whole of the uh, population, it's a really, really significant component in terms of reducing, uh, reducing carbon emissions. So... Um, so I think smart metering um, and uh, making sure that customers are engaged as far as they possibly can in this uh, is is a really important part of the uh, part of the equation here. It's not the full answer, but it's a key part of the equation. Yes, that's the reason of re-raising this question is for customers because they are the ones for whom we do this all. And uh, do you think uh, there is a good chance that smart metering can be a facilitating means to raise the interest? of customers, even in the countries where they do not uh, consume 10 or 12,000 kilowatt hours per year, so that they also can participate in demand response programs, etc. Because obviously the countries like, for example, in Norway, I remember there is about 10 or 11,000 kilowatt hours per household, and that is clear incentive. But do you think that smart metering can help also in the countries where there is a low electricity consumption? to make it interesting for customers to participate in demand response and flexibility programs, because this might be quite an important contribution. You see this potential yeah. in smart meeting? Yeah, look, I think um, if, you t if you turn the question the other way um, and say in the absence of smart metering, uh, will customers be able to do do anything or engage in this? I think the answer to that is it's a clear no. So um, certainly, um, I would like to think, and it and it goes back um, to George's introduction about um, uh, public perception and public awareness generally about uh, climate action as a real challenge for uh, this generation now, uh, in order to support uh, um, future generations. It's really important, I think, first of all, to give people the tool, the tools. So if people have their own um, uh, availability of their own data and they understand what their consumption is, and at the same time, then um, supply companies or aggregators or other uh, innovative service providers come and make offerings to, uh, to, uh, to those customers. Uh, offering them uh, different opportunities, whether it's to be used for demand side response or whether it's to using using phase shifting of uh, of demand or demand aggregation or peer to peer trading or what whatever those uh, innovation innovative options are, I think the um, the platform that is the uh, that customer's data allows that customer then to engage with that. Um, uh, look, it's a it's a big ask to to get everybody in a population um, interested, and engaged in something like this. But uh, getting a significant number uh, engaged can make a significant difference, I think. And if we can get a critical mass engaged, then it's it's possible to build on that. So I think it could be, um, it's 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 one of the levers. So when I was speaking before, trying to think forward, as we were trying to think forward to seventy percent renewables or beyond seventy percent renewables on a on a um, on a on an island grid, really, where with uh, with limited interconnection at the moment, um, 
these one percent are going to make a big difference uh, so everywhere it's possible to get a benefit everywhere it's possible so for example uh, more static forms of data like uh, looking at the constraint profile and the curtailment profile of um, of renewables and wind so that uh, transmission and distribution between them can think uh, and, and invest in uh, grid reinforcement to reduce that constraint it might be half a percent or one percent but it's an important one percent and equally on that uh, on the customer side customer behavior i think is going to be an, uh, really important and not just customer behavior but how uh, potentially innovative service providers offer opportunities to customers to engage with their electricity i think is going to be another small but significant part of the equation i hope anyway Farik, if i can elaborate thank you on Farik. so i think you put it in a good in a good relation that Without it, it would be more difficult. Okay, let's continue with another. For sure. Quite Tahir, can I can I stay on that point for a second? Uh, can I, yeah, can sorry, I elaborate? Sorry, yes, sure. I, I think it's a very important point. And there's a in Estonia we have 100% smart meters, and further than that, every uh, every electricity bill is actually billed hourly. So we we don't use. Uh, so if you consume at different times of day, you actually, your bill can be lower, and. It comes down to um, uh, a question of the social acceptance of the change in price. Can can we uh, allow the price fluctuations that come from renewables reach homes and households? And that, that will be a difficult uh, discussion politically in most of Europe. But uh, it will be made easier if there are automated tools possible. If, if you heat your home electrically, you can have a, a thermostat that checks the day ahead price and then turns on and off. And these solutions are already out there. So. These are what we need and that are absolutely necessary for smart meter data. So, And also my, from my personal experience in the past, I went to several homes and I saw people who manually, uh, they have a switch on their uh, water heater and they turn it manually on and off uh, during the day and night so that they can save money. So there's certainly a, a significant part of the population who really care about saving money. But the other part of the population cares about the environment. So from my experience of having gone to hundreds of homes and spoken to many people, a significant part of people care. But... There's one challenge with smart meter data today, and the, and what we have is also our responsibility as DSOs, TSOs to solve is that innovators who want access to that data don't have it today. So if I want to share my home smart meter data with a third-party innovator, in most European countries, it's very hard to do, and it's not uh, not only on the household level but also industrial level. So there's um, Google and Microsoft have uh, announced that they they want to move to 100% renewable energy for their data centers every hour of the day uh, by 2030. I think it was Google by 2030. So that is going to require the movement of the data, the consumption history has to be accessible to innovators because somebody has to then sell them the electricity. And, and this link is today missing. So first step, we have to put smart meters in place. Second step, you have to have consent-based data sharing. And there's an initiative that Ellering has been leading called the Data Bridge Alliance uh, to make that uh, harmonized around Europe and there's also legal background on that so uh, check out Data Bridge Alliance if you want to find out more about the uh, da smart meter data yeah, sharing around Europe. It's, it's absolutely critical as you say that not just have the data but also have access to the data. Now let's move on. There, are, There is one actually two practical questions concerning the regional security coordinators and I'd like to address it to you, where uh, maybe others can, can help. I mean, we have a vision of clean energy package and what's happening in 2025, 2030, whatever. If you consider the regional coordination in 10 to 15 years, so how the security coordination with RSPs and TSOs would look like in the future, then what would you say, what data, what information is missing today for the RSC, for the RSCs to fulfill their mission? What do you think so? I'm not a professor. Uh, however, if I would like to make up a scenario, um, we uh, we would uh, expect, um, of course, um, a high amount of dispersed generation, which today does not play a role in terms of data on the RSC level. Um, however, um, uh, if this is the future market, um, we need to uh, to take care of it. Uh, and if we are um, um, taking care further for the horizontal security coordination together with the TSOs, this only can work if the vertical coordination between TSOs and DSOs, but also the, um, the aggregators um, and market parties works properly. Um, uh, 
to 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 think 15 years ahead th this would mean and maybe this is just a kind of wish instead of um, um, knowing exactly uh, how is how this will be done um, it's it's necessary that uh, we find pragmatic solutions on the one hand to provide um, out of uh, the whole community the data that is that is needed uh, to uh, make the uh, transmission uh, security assessment in a proper manner, but then to feed back the result to those who help to solve potential security issues. And uh, this is a mass of, uh, of uh, users then in the end that uh, might um, follow these um, coordinated actions and the requirements we are, uh, we are identifying on our level. However, uh, we need to reach all those um, stakeholders that have a liability being the TSOs uh, to take care what uh, coordinated actions mean for them. The, T the DSOs uh, who might have a lot of uh, um, generators and other flexibility um, connected to their grid, uh, they all have to make their part of the decision making um, in order to keep the system, have to keep the system safe in the end. In the end, um, I would assume it's, it's more about the data sharing it's to find pragmatic solutions uh, because we, as RSC, I would not expect that we can process all the data that is uh, somewhere created in the industry, uh, but we need to find uh, pragmatic solutions on the one hand to aggregate, but at the same time uh, to be able also to, to check um, is the quality enough and if not, uh, what is the reason behind. So from that perspective, I would also see that there's a uh, um, uh, uh, high requirement on uh, local decision making and also local assessments further. This will not change due to the fact that uh, the RSCs are available in the future. Thank you very much, Uwe. We have still few minutes left and I'm coming to close to an end of our list of questions. And there are two, one, two questions which are very well related together and also to the activity we are pursuing together. Uh, and this is the data quality, integrity, and business continuity. Um, uh, together with DSOs and CSOs, we are currently preparing uh, for the future drafting and development of the cybersecurity network code, which will likely, hopefully, in the next year, give us a better platform for that. But uh, I'd like to raise this question to each of the three of you and maybe to make it a concluding one, because I think we live in a world of cyber threats security, not just security of operation, but also security of our data communication, data communication path, integrity of data is crucial. We see that our business is endangered if it is not functioning properly. So I'd like to ask each of you three to give us your view on key elements to ensure data quality, integrity, and cyber security, continuity of our business in the next years to come. So maybe to start with you, Paddy. Uh, if you would also reflect on our more informal exchange we are having at the moment on the cyber security, what needs to be contained there, and how do you value this? Paddy, please, first you, and then with yeah, us, uh, uh, Georg and Uwe. Then. Thanks, thanks, uh, Tahir. Um, so I, I think, um, I think the really important um, aspect of this, uh, when I when I look back at how. Um, the discussions and the cooperation around data have developed over the last number of years. And I see the accelerating uh, effort that's been put into this by uh, DSOs and TSOs, and also then working together and working with Europe, whether it's on cybersecurity or um, the uh, Smart Grids Working Group. Uh, what I see when I look at that work is a very, um, an appropriately measured, um, balancing of a number of different factors. So we have factors around um, the importance of uh, having lots of data and lots of access to data to, to encourage innovation on the one hand. But then we have um, counterbalancing um, concerns to make sure that uh, uh, data security, uh, security issues, but also data privacy. Uh, so um, I really like the way in which the uh, TSOs and DSOs have worked together step by step, building this um, pro uh, gradual progression towards uh, interoperability and ultimately convergence. 
And um, I think this is a really important way to go because it's too serious and significant an issue um, to uh, not to do it in a, in a really considered way. So I think the most important thing, without calling out actual specifics, the most important thing is probably the process by which we continue to make progress in this area. And I think um, cybersecurity uh, uh, working group and the smart um, grid working group are two of the core uh, pillars of the uh, TSO DSO um, uh, work program for this year. And there's real progress being made, but I think what's really important is um, that we do this in a considered way. I think there's another um, uh, another possible perspective around this, which is uh, we can look at um, centralization and the benefits of centralization on the one hand. We can actually look at uh, distributed and dispersed and the benefits on the, on, of that on the other hand. And from a security point of view, but also an innovation point of view, uh, centralization and distribution bring different challenges and different benefits in each case. And I think this longer term solution is going to require, um, it's not, it, it, there is no clear route to the right answer at the moment. And that's why I think it's really important that we move forward on both of those fronts, uh, making sure that we recognize um, national requirements, national differences on the one hand, but we're also in the longer term thinking about uh, convergence and, and interoperability. Um, so I suppose the, the yeah. So look, overall, Thanks a lot, Freddie. I, Thank you. As my, my final comment really is, uh, has to be going back to that cooperation between TSO and DSO and distribution. Distribution being the, um, at, at the edge of the grid and facing into co customers and consumers and all those different service providers who are keen to provide ser the services are going to be required to take uh, um, to to allow and facilitate the intermittent renewables on our on our grid as we move to uh, ultimately net zero carbon in, in the future. So thanks, Taylor. Thank you, Paddy. Yeah, thank you very much. It's really uh, again a rather wide and overarching answer, uh, Georg. Maybe a concrete one, because I think Paddy covers quite a lot. Absolutely. You are a digitalization manager, and you are, you are, you are dealing with, with, uh, with uh, one issue which is quite, uh, quite difficult. Centralization versus distribution, security, right? So you can have perfectly secure central system, which is then more vulnerable, or you can have less coordinated security in a plethora of distributed uh, architectures and so on. What really a short, just maybe to give us a short glimpse before we move to Uber to conclude. What do you think? How is this balance managed? How can you manage the balance? What to centralize and what to make distributed? For sure, uh, uh, the answer to that is that we need a digital platform for uh, coordinating system operation. And the key is that you make decisions locally, but you share information to make those decisions on. And you use open source tools on which you make those decisions. So basically, uh, it's about cooperation, but I'd like to finish on a different point. The point is that we can talk a lot about the uh, co collaboration among TSOs, DSOs, but we also need to talk about open markets and allowing the information to reach the innovators, opening up data for the markets so that the people who put the solutions out in markets know where to, where to go and how to do it. So the data topic reaches so basically even your answer more broadly. Would be that the industry, we should be listening to the industry. So not to prescribe, but listen to the industry and uh, follow a little bit also what is going there regarding this centralization versus decentralization. Is it what you say? No, my answer is that we need to do uh, share data, make decisions locally. So keep control of, uh, uh, of grid operation locally, share data in the RSC, RSC world, uh, and open up data for the markets so that innovators can provide the solutions we all need. So kind of think globally, act locally and coordinate regionally, something Perfect. like this. I think it's our motto for the, for the regional coordination. It brings us, I would say, to the concluding words and also on the same time. Uh, now, uh, we've managed really, and I think we are all play, pleased about it, to have RSC uh, as a member of our ISO family and all work we do at NCOE, but security is really a matter, really an issue. So would you then try to conclude this uh, panel also with your view 
how and where to focus our efforts on uh, cybersecurity, data quality, and integrity of our RSE and between RSEs and TSOs. Yeah, um, many thanks. I would I would uh, like to, to to drill it down a little bit on the level of the business continuity because uh, on the one hand, and I would like to start with this um, statement: uh, think globally, act locally. Um, it's it's key that in 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 a situation where um, we create a lot of independencies between uh, the players that we. On the, on the one hand, also provide with the, the regional coordination a kind of centralization of certain tasks uh, that uh, we do not lose the site in case we uh, cannot execute uh, this more central regional service um, properly. Uh, so this means that um, when, the, when creating a lot of dependencies um, on the level of data, on the level of processes, uh, that we are always considering the fact that if something happens and some um, task cannot be executed anymore, what is the consequence on those uh, who are uh, have to, t uh, to have to take care uh, of the consequences, like TSOs, but also the, uh, the, the DSOs? Uh, so this is, um, um, in my in my eyes, um, an important topic because a lot of uh, processes and methodologies we are now implementing, um, which are um, mathematically driven, uh, it's sometimes not easy to overlook by a single person uh, the consequence if a certain function fails. And from that perspective, it's key that uh, on this level we find uh, this balance uh, between central processes, but also the decentralization where um, I would assume this is the fallback um, for keeping the system secure, that uh, the decision-making stays on the, on the local level, um, and uh, that we also consider um, the fact that uh, our service is also not a perfect one and maybe not 100% reliable, and in the end also the, the industry needs to, uh, needs to uh, deal with it in the end. Thank you for this, I think, very good concluding answer to the list of questions which we actually exhausted. I don't see anything open yet. There have been some comments only, but they can be posted later on, but no questions left. Uh, this brings us to an end of our session of our panel just in time, and I'd like to use the opportunity and thank you all for being patient with technology. I apologize for the initial problems with connecting. And I'd like really very much to thank you all the three panelists for your professionalism, for your excellent answers. And to say finally, obviously in one hour, you can't properly address uh, something what is essential for our business, for, uh, for keeping the, the energy needs of Europe for climate change, like data and information exchange. So please consider this session, which will be recorded also as a food for thought, as an initiative for your own uh, uh, active participation, be it in your uh, TSO, DSO, in your industry. Uh, as Georg said, also, we need to listen to uh, industry leaders, to researchers, and we need to provide access to the important information and data to those who are best uh, able to, to, to provide solutions we need. I would like to conclude to say again, thank you very much for active and very constructive participation and to conclude our panel one now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jahir. Thank you for the panel, all the speakers. Before we head for a little break for lunch, allow me to introduce our next keynote speech. This is from Mr. Remy Maillet. He is the acting head of Energy Security and Safety Unit at the European Commission. Mr. Maillet, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. And thank you first, the organizers, for the invitation. That's really a pleasure to be at this conference of the regional security coordinators, because as you know, the mission of the GNR in the European Commission is to help ensure access to clean, affordable energy, but also secure energy for all Europeans. 
And the question that I would therefore like to address in this session uh, is, is COVID a threat to energy security? And let me first say that the pandemic has not caused any supply disruption. I think it is a sign of uh, the good preparedness of the sector and a sign of the good functioning of the internal energy market. We should not forget that the uh, energy sector, like all other sectors, had to adapt to this uh, new situation. The uh, operators, first the operators, the transmission system operators, had to implement uh, exceptional business arrangement to uh, maintain the continuity of their critical operations while, of course, preserving the safety of their workers. At market level, the crisis drastically reduced the demand up to 25% in certain member states, 25%. But energy prices could react and the internal energy market could absorb this major demand shock. At the regulatory level, member states and the Commission could preserve the mobility of essential workers, including, including in the energy sector, the, uh, and the cross-border mobility of the energy uh, uh, workers, in spite of the lockdowns and the uh, travel restrictions. Uh, in member states, Measures were also taken to protect the vulnerable consumers. Social measures or measures in the energy sectors, be it to uh, extend moratoriums on uh, disconnections or defer the payment of the uh, bills for households or small undertakings in difficulties. So there has been a lot of exchanges uh, across borders in Europe uh, at different levels uh, that goes on. Um, first, uh, between operators in European associations like uh, ENSOE, in uh, the numerous commissions working groups, um, in particular the Electricity Coalition Group or the European Nuclear Safety Regulators Group, uh, and also at political level. At political level, the energy ministers themselves discuss uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the energy system twice in April and June in the Council. So uh, to take stock of uh, all those uh, exchanges at different levels, the Commission uh, published a document on energy security and pandemic risk in June. And I invite you to look at it. It's available on our uh, website in different languages. It identifies short-term risk, long-term risk, and a series of 20 good practices in, uh, in member states. This was in June. No, unfortunately, uh, the EU uh, confronts with the resurgence of COVID cases uh, and, uh, in fact, a second wave of the pandemic. So we rediscussed the situation uh, within the Electricity Question Group. Most member states and operators have reintroduced the necessary measures uh, as already taken in uh, spring, including measures identified in the list of good practices that I just mentioned, strict rules on telework, special measures in control room. And in a way, these measures have become a new normal. Everybody is better prepared than in spring, that is clear. But there is another issue that the electricity prevention group had to discuss. This is uh, the impact of uh, the uh, postponement of the maintenance operation, which uh, has led to, uh, in certain member states at least, higher than usual unavailability uh, of power plants. And this is the result of the first wave. Um, overall, the electricity caution group is uh, confident, as well as the uh, relevant member states, that that will not lead to uh, uh, security issues for the, for the winter. But of course, from the Commission side, we very much look forward to reading the details of the uh, winter outlook prepared by uh, NSOE and to be released next week. And it is clear that for this winter, we will all need a closer, 
reinforce vigilance, uh, in particular in cases of a, of a cold wave, uh, and especially the uh, vigilance by the regional security coordinators. There are also uh, longer term risks created or amplified by the pandemic. Cyber security. The pandemic has accelerated our dependency to digital tools, increased its surface to possible intrusions and attacks, be it by cyber criminals or persistent advanced threat actors. Uh, long term impacts also on uh, uh, investments. The uh, uh, World Energy Outlook of the International Energy Agency for 2020 estimates a drop of energy investments of 18%, 18%. If so, that will be the largest ever drop of energy investments in history. Third, the crisis has also been a wake-up call for Europe that it needs more resilient supply chains for certain critical products and the technologies, including energy technologies, to repair the grid or install new storage or uh, renewable uh, facilities. Now, turning to the aftermath of the crisis and uh, what we can do at European level. The first is to integrate pandemic risk in the implementation of the risk preparedness regulation in the electricity sector. Member states are right now preparing their national plans. And uh, NSOE identified a few weeks ago a list of regional risk scenarios that member states should uh, consider in their plans. And this list mention a pandemic risk. And uh, from the general side, we can only invite you to uh, follow up this recommendation of uh, NSOE. The second area of work is to follow up the security union strategy adopted by the Commission in July to address uh, the internal and external threats of the uh, EU. This strategy focuses really on areas with a clear European adv added value to the work of uh, the national uh, uh, authorities to protect their own national security. And uh, one of those areas with clear European added value is the energy sector. And the strategy says two things on energy. First, please accelerate the work on the network code for the cyber security of cross-border electricity flows. And DGNR will very soon now launch a targeted stakeholder consultation on the basis of the second interim report of the drafting team. And I would like to thank here the expert of NSOE and the uh, various uh, European associations of uh, distribution system operators. And I thank them for their work and for their engagement. Uh, and the strategy calls uh, also for joint actions to further improve the resilience of critical energy infrastructure not only against cyber threats, but also against physical and hybrid threats. The third area is to uh, uh, boost our investments in the energy sector. I hope that we'll have very soon now an agreement on the uh, EU next long-term budget and the recovery plan. This is, this is really key for the uh, economic recovery of Europe. This is key to compensate the uh, strong decrease of energy investments, which I mentioned, uh, as a result of uh, the pandemic. And this is key also to support the new proposed climate target of 25% by 2030. And uh, it's therefore very important to, to make the best of this future uh, European budget, and in particular for member states to design in, in a, the most optimal way their national recovery and resilience plan, which, which, which are now in preparation and which, uh, in our view, should uh, finance the necessary uh, investments for clean and secure energy. Now, let me conclude by a quote of uh, President von der Leyen uh, at the peak of the crisis uh, in March. Uh, Europe should act with one big earth, not 27 small ones. And in fact, the, the resilience of the European energy system is about solidarity and cooperation across borders, cooperation between member states and cooperation between operators. 
And the regional security coordinators really embody this regional cooperation by tackling very concrete issues to preserve security of supply. So I wish you good discussion and good continuation of your work. And uh, uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayer. We have received uh, quite a number of questions concerning this kind of cooperation that you were already mentioning, uh, but also highlighting the ongoing pandemic situation. So the first question is as follows. In your opinion, have European TSOs coordinated enough to manage the pandemic situation? Thank you for the uh, uh, question. Uh, they have uh, coordinated, they have exchanged uh, uh, information and uh, we are very glad uh, in the European Commission that uh, instance could uh, organize this exchange of information and uh, we could use uh, the information channeled by uh, NSUI in the discussion with, with member states, electricity coercion groups. I would like to say that, however, the uh, cooperation between the TSO uh, as a follow-up of the pandemic and uh, more broadly to ensure security of supply, in our view, should, uh, should uh, go on, should, uh, should increase. Um, we need more and more cooperation between uh, between TSO, um, and in particular, uh, uh, as you know, the regional security coordinators will we, we'll have progressively to move from regional security coordinators to regional coordination centers, um, and uh, we also need to further develop the exchange of information on a number of issues now, uh, more linked to security between. Uh, uh, be, between operators, uh, cyber security, for instance, perhaps we'll mention it later on again. And uh, uh, there may be, we are aware that there may be obstacles also for the exchange of information between uh, uh, between operators, between TSOs. And that may be an issue that we uh, could look at it. Thank you very much. Well, it's quite mild in Estonia these days, and I'm uh, pretty sure the weather's nice in Belgium too. But uh, what, what do you expect from the winter? I mean, uh, do you see any risk of uh, 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 the upcoming winter in, in European uh, power sector because of the pandemic again? We uh, very much look forward to reading the uh, future uh, winter outlook of NSOE uh, to be uh, published uh, next week. Um, we had a, a f we had a discussion, of course, in the uh, electricity question group, and uh, as I mentioned uh, in my intervention, uh, the uh, uh, pandemic had an impact on uh, the program to maintain. Uh, uh, infrastructure, um, power plants, uh, so a number of operations had to be postponed, which of course had an impact also on the availability of power plants now. Um, and uh, uh, that has raised question which we, which we discussed, and uh, overall the results of the discussion, as I mentioned, is that uh, the Electricity Equation Group is confident that uh, we will deal uh, with uh, any possible issues uh, in the next uh, in the next winter uh, uh, because also the energy demand will be probably lower also as a result of uh, the current uh, pandemic and the different measures taken by member states uh, and uh, at the same time uh, the uh, 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 connections between member states are there and uh, will help to uh, uh, trade uh, electricity uh, between member states and in particular for those member states who may face a more difficult situation in the winter to help them to uh, import uh, more electricity than uh, usual than the previous uh, years. Moreover, uh, many member states have quite well advanced already uh, risk preparedness programs, in fact, although they have not been notified to the Commission, they, they are, of course, already uh, risk preparedness programs. Uh, there are a number of measures which can be taken uh, 
uh, like interruptible contracts or uh, uh, a number of measures which uh, over are confident will uh, enable a proper uh, management of the situation. And of course, a reinforced vigilance will be needed this winter. Reinforced vigilance by all member states societies, uh, but also, and in particular, the regional security coordinators. Uh, can changes in the human behavior that we've seen in the pandemic situation have a long-term effect on consumption patterns and well, the overall energy needs? What do you think? That is a very interesting. That is a very interesting, a very interesting question, and uh, um, I would uh, say that this is probably uh, something that we have to. Uh, um, really uh, assess and look at uh, in the uh, next week and months. We probably do not have enough distance to fully appreciate the likely profound impact that this uh, crisis uh, has had on our uh, uh, behavior, on, on the uh, patterns of the demand, which is uh, uh, likely to be strong, we can see it in the mobility sector, for instance. And uh, uh, what I can say is that an important milestone for us to level to do this assessment will probably be the series of uh, uh, proposals that will make clear in application of the 2055, uh, in application of the 2030 target and uh, the 55 target. Uh, we will uh, have to update our, our scenario uh, and certainly take into account uh, the uh, effects of the pandemic on uh, the energy demand. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayer, for your inspiring thoughts. Dear friends, it's now time for a lunch break and I invite you back to our virtual conference space. Uh, 20 minutes past one, that is Estonian time or let's say 20 minutes past 12 according to Central European time. We will have three parallel sessions that are prepared for you and links can be found on the RCS 2020 web page. Now, managing the health crisis is not exactly a responsibility for the RSCs, but the following video will help you to remind about the services that are at the very core of the RSCs. For TSOs, the security of the European electricity system has always been and remains a key issue, now more than ever before. Sancho, let's attack this giant! They are now supported by the RSCs, which offer them coordinated analyses conducted at regional level to help ensure security of supply. Engineers study the future behaviour of the grid. I see. I see. I, uh, I don't see an awful lot here. Using the CGM. Oh yes, I know, the common grid model. Ah, now this is better. They anticipate the various combinations of potential risks. Uh, no! And what if the grid runs too great a risk? The RSCs, in agreement with the TSOs, coordinate to identify corrective measures so that the TSOs can dispatch flows and avoid congestion. These daily reports enable TSOs to identify the best options so that they can avoid major disruption. Yes, but no engineer can predict the unpredictable. Not even the TSOs and RSCs engineers. Major disruption cannot be always prevented. In this case, the RSCs combine their efforts to send TSOs vital information as the situation develops to help them manage tense situations. Yes! Dear friends, welcome back everyone. I hope you treated yourself well with, uh, with some lunch. I guess it's one of the drawbacks of those virtual events that you can't really mingle uh, during those lunch breaks at the queue waiting for your dish, but well, I guess Times being what they are, we have to live with it. It's now time to dive deeper into detail and get technical. 
We have three parallel sessions prepared for you. You can find all the links and the appropriate windows to choose your favorite at the RSC 2020 webpage. Now, there's one looking at the data availability to support regional coordination and cooperation. Parallel session number two will look at how digital tools and open source as a tool advances the IT cooperation between RSCs. And the third parallel session will focus on the challenges in the regulatory framework for regional coordination. Now, if you're interested in how data can support regional cooperation, this is actually the place to be. You're on the right window. Uh, I will now give the floor to Kaja Valdma, who will lead this session here. Dear fellow colleagues from uh, TSOs all over Europe, dear colleagues from Mellering, dear representatives of uh, NSOE and, uh, and member state governments and support organizations, my name is Kaja Waldma and I'm the product manager of, uh, of Estfeed at Ellering, Estonia. And I'm the moderator of this panel. So thank you very much for joining uh, our panel on data availability to support regional coordination and cooperation between TSOs. So we'll have a one hour session uh, where we will look at different IT platforms and tools that uh, TSOs all over Europe use to, uh, uh, to coordinate and cooperate between each other. Uh, I hope it will be interesting. Uh, it is interesting for me, definitely, because on an everyday basis, I'm, I, I work more with consumer meter data access. So I'm very excited to deepen my knowledge on, on the technical tools and, and, and platforms that the TSOs use on their everyday basis. So in the following, uh, we'll have about uh, a 28 minute uh, long video where we have four pre recorded presentations by key experts in the area. So, first, Oliver Ein, uh, uh, the standardization and interoperability manager at NSOE, will talk about the standardization of uh, common, commonly used data formats and, uh, and, and information models in the EU. Then Eric Wolfs, uh, the enterprise architect at Corresa SA, uh, will talk about uh, about uh, will give a presentation about ECOSB, which is uh, a message exchange standardization and possible architecture for business applications. And he will also give you an example based on the following uh, presentation. So he will introduce the, the following uh, presentation, which is about uh, short uh, short term adequacy and uh, outage planning coordination as an introduction to the following uh, presentation presented by Jayaram Ananda, the OPC project group convener and service lead at TSC Net. So he will give you an overview of the uh, OPC and SDA tool itself and the lessons learned and, and what were the challenges uh, with implementation there. And finally, I, I will also, uh, you will also see a video where I present the, uh, the main activities that Ellering has led in Europe in the area of consumer meter data access. And, uh, and, talk, uh, and there I will talk about Estfeed and the European data access pilots. So after the video videos, we'll have a 20 minute question, uh, about 20 minute question answer discussion round. So feel free to post your, your questions during the videos to our uh, Slido uh, environment, uh, hashtag RSC2020. And now let's continue with the videos. Thank you. Hello everybody, this is Olivier N from NSOE. Uh, I am uh, supporting the standardization and interoperability activity in NSOE. Uh, today, we are going to talk about uh, the common information model and the standardized uh, data exchange for uh, NSOE community, so including the, the TSOs, the RSCs, uh, and uh, the stakeholders. Uh, so, first of all, what we are doing is that we are actively uh, supporting the development of and the implementation of standardized data exchange formats uh, that are used uh, among different act electricity actors. Uh, the goal is uh, to facilitate uh, the establishment of a secure, well-functioning and cost-efficient 
European electricity market. So we are supporting the implementation of the network codes and other, re other regulations uh, and also, uh, for example, the clean energy package that is coming now. Uh, to do that, uh, how we are organized uh, within ENSUI for the standardization activity. So there is a, a group that is called the SIM Expert Group, Common Information Model Expert Group, that you see uh, uh, in the middle of this slide. And this is a group where we uh, get the consensus of the TSOs uh, for the standardization activity and especially for the data exchange. And this group reports to the board uh, through the digital committee. So uh, as soon as we have a topic where we don't have the consensus, we go to the digital committee and then to the board. And uh, we report also to the business committee of NSUE, market committee, system operation committee, and system development committee uh, for uh, the approval of uh, documents that are then published on the NSUE website. So the SIM expert group is to get the consensus and to do the work, uh, we uh, are we have subgroups and data exchange projects. So for example, the subgroups, uh, it is CGMES standardization, so common grid model uh, exchange specification standardization, ESMP standardization, so European style market profile standardization, role model subgroup, communication standard subgroup. Uh, uh, so for the communication standard, uh, Eric will give uh, more uh, details on the activity uh, in the communication standard subgroup. Then we have data exchange project. So each time we have a, a project from the, the regulation or from the TSOs uh, that needs to have some um, data exchange format uh, harmonized or, or determined, then we open a project. So for example, we have the balancing project, we have FSCAR, um, CSA, so coordinated security analysis, uh, and uh, several others, like for example, uh, in the clean energy package, we have the capacity registry uh, uh, tool uh, with a data action project. When the project is finished, we close the project. So now, uh, what is uh, uh, the, uh, let's say, the involvement in international standardization uh, organization? So how CIMEXPAD Group uh, liaises with this organization? So first of all, uh, we draft the standard in, in CIMEXPAD Group, and we do it in close collaboration with the implementation project, and then, when these uh, draft standards are written, we liaise with the standardization uh, organization uh, to push this standard to the IEC or CENELEC. And uh, we ask the members to uh, influence the vote, so to vote uh, yes to the standards that we uh, are uh, proposing. And when the standards are published, then we can also uh, have the conformity assessment organized. Uh, so as I said, there are many uh, network code implementation projects that are using the SIM. So here you can see uh, several of them. And um, some of them are using the, the SIM for market. So IEC 62325. And some others are using the, the SIM for uh, grid model, SIM for operation, IEC 61970. Uh, and um, uh, here uh, is now the... Uh, the, the overview of the ongoing data exchange work. So I divided again here from market and, and CGMA, so operational system development. And uh, in the three horizontal uh, uh, axes, uh, you have uh, the network code. So the first uh, uh, layer is the network codes, all the projects that are uh, related to the network code. Then we have the projects that are related to the clean energy package. And we have also an activity of research where we are uh, trying to uh, find the, the, the future of the, of the data exchange standard um, to support with the use case that are coming, that we know are coming, uh, but for which there is not yet an op uh, a project that is open. So let's continue. Uh, let's take an example. Uh, let's focus on the CSA, so Coordinated Security Analysis. And uh, let's see how we handle one project like the CSA and what do we deliver for, for, for this project. So first of all, we build the use case. So here you can see uh, the CSA uh, use case. So for to build the use case, we have bubbles with the use case and we have 
uh, some bodies that are the roles that are uh, playing uh, in this use case. So here, for example, uh, there is the system operator that is played by the TSOs. Uh, there is the remedial action coordinator uh, that uh, will be uh, the coordination function. Uh, there is the remedial action optimization operator, which is so the, the RAO, so it will be played uh, by the RSCs. Uh, so all these roles are um, interacting together in use cases. And when we have uh, drawn the use cases, then we dig a little bit more into the detail and we draw the sequence diagram. So you can see that we still keep the same roles on the top of the sequence diagram. And then we design each and every uh, communication uh, that is uh, done. So uh, data exchange that is done between two roles. Uh, so, for example, here you can see uh, update list of uh, available remedial actions. And uh, for each of these uh, data exchanges, then we build a profile. So the next slide, uh, draft data model for remedial action. We have the profile for the remedial action. Uh, that is a data UML model uh, with classes and attributes. And from that, we can uh, have code components like uh, RDFS, OCL rules, XSDs, uh, that are derived from the UML and that can be used directly in the computers of uh, uh, of the tools that are doing the data exchange. So that's uh, that's uh, pretty it for me. Uh, so how can we interact in the future? So for the TSOs, uh, you can liaise with your CIMEXPAT group member and corresponding member. So I put the link here. Uh, for the RSCs or TSOs, you can join a task force uh, to deliver data exchange format for projects. So if you are part of a project or interested in a project, uh, you can uh, contribute. We, in the task force, we are uh, sometimes uh, five to 10 uh, experts uh, working together. Um, then uh, for any stakeholders, you can check our use case. Uh, uh, you can check and use our EDI and CGMES library. So EDI is for electronic data interchange and CGMES common grid model exchange specification. And we have uh, two libraries. So I put the link again, uh, where we publish all our data exchange formats. Uh, so don't hesitate to go uh, to these libraries uh, to see if uh, a format fits for your needs and you can always uh, contact me as well uh, to, uh, to to interact. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please uh, don't hesitate. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Eric Wolves, and I'm the architect lead of both Corizo and Ensoe. Today, I'm going to give a short presentation about ECHOSP, the Ensoe integration platform. ECHOSP, which stands for Ensoe Communication and Connectivity Service Platform, is owned and maintained by NSOE to facilitate distributed processes as regional capacity calculation platforms and to provide the communication layer for pan-European applications like STA, OPC and OPDE. Its main goal is to provide a communication platform that is secure and trustworthy. It will become one of the architectural building blocks in the NSOE reference architecture available for local, regional and pan-European TSO projects. East Echo SP is based on two software components, ECP as a communication platform and EDX, which extends the functionality of ECP by adding a service layer. A short history to start with. First version of ECP was implemented by me for usage by the CWE TSOs in 2009, after CWE took over the project from ETSO, because ETSO decided after a procurement phase to not go further with implementation. This version, based on the CWE TSO requirements, was followed by a version 2.1 to include the requirements of other TSOs who were interested in using ECP. In 2012, NSOE Workgroup EDI started a task force with me as convener to standardize the interfaces and functionality of ECP in a specification called the MALDE standard. As in 2014 there was a request from NSOE to start using ECP as communication channel for data providers of the transparency platform, it was decided to hand over the ownership to NSOE and to start working on version 3 of ECP 
to include the requirements of the project. In 2016, the current version of ECP was designed, together with EDX, to fulfill the requirements needed to construct the OPDE platform, leading in 2017 to a new version of the MADE standard compliant with the latest version of ECP. ECOSP is software specified and owned by the TSOs for usage by the TSOs. It's created by integrating ECP and ADX into one product so it can be used to create a transversal communication network for TSOs and other market players. As ECOSP is based on the asynchronous communication pattern, it's not fit for time critical data transfers. Message delivery is guaranteed, but not a possible delay linked to the communication pattern. The MADIS communication platform has following capabilities. Reliability, messages accepted by the MADIS platform are always delivered. Security, messages are encrypted and only readable using the private key of the receiver. Non-repudiation, messages are signed by the sender and all the components are authenticated in the network by a central certification authority. ECOSP consists of different components, each with its own functionality. First, we have the central components. The ECP component directory is functioning as address book and central authenticator. The ECP broker is persisting the messages until the receiver is ready to accept them. The central service catalog is used by EDX to route messages to the correct service providers. Locally, we have the ECP endpoint and EDX toolbox that communicate on one side with the local business applications and on the other side with the central components. ECOSP is one of the building blocks available in the reference architecture at ENSOE. In the meantime, other components were added when designing the architecture for STA and OPC applications. The first one is the message handling component that take care of the local message handling validations, transformations, and message management. So business applications can focus on the business logic and do not need to implement the needed message management logic, but can use the functionality provided by this business block. Another component is the authentication component that allows sign in on authentication for all applications integrating this building block. The evolution of the reference architecture is not stopping. Currently in the pipeline, we have, for example, the definition of a protocol that can be used as a common language to communicate with services on ECOSP. For example, to do data requests in a uniform way, avoiding that each service develops its own language, but instead creates vocabulary conform the defined language. More and more processes are running between services deployed and operated at different locations. For this functionality, it's needed to govern these processes in a non-blocking way. ECOSP will provide the functionality to make choreography between these services possible. A component will be defined to trace and monitor these processes so reliability can be guaranteed. I hope this short overview was able to give you an idea how ECOSP can help to facilitate the data interoperability when implementing RSC regional or pan-European projects and I'll stay available for answering questions and discuss possible topics. Thank you for your attention. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Jairam Ananta. So I work for TSNet Services, one of the RSCs based in Munich. Um, today, I'm here to share the OPC and STA Pan-European IT tools and its um, uh, stories from the business point of view. Um, yeah, let's start. Um, so before starting the presentation, I really want to highlight the fact that both tools are operational. And when I say operational, it means um, it's uh, it, it fulfilled the, um, the legal requirements from the network codes. So yeah, so I think this is the major highlight. So we all say it's pan-European tool, pan-European tool. So what it really means is that uh, 
it covers all the ENSO ETSOs and uh, which is not only EU TSOs but also non EU TSOs. So, this an, um, the scope of these uh, services or tools is uh, goes beyond the EU definition, um, which is really important to note. Mm, um, this is an incredible um, achievement in the sense um, that European electricity grid is the largest interconnected uh, uh, system or a largest technical system in the world. Um, so, so this the process, uh, the STNOPC process is uh, 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 is uh, will serve the uh, let's say the to to make sure that uh, the whole European electricity system functions smoothly uh, without any um, security issues. So I think this is important to note. And it's what is really critical or uh, what is really the highlight um, is uh, to note is that it involves 38 plus TSOs um, and uh, uh, six RSCs soon. So it's really a, a huge amount of stakeholders involved in developing this project. Um, um, I think um, from outage po uh, planning point of view, this is very, very interesting to note because um the outage planning exists for last let's say um, last um, 100 years let's say um and all these uh, national uh, tsos have a, have a, uh, their own way of doing outage planning and then what we did over the last few years is that to bring together all the 38 tsos and um, you know, ask them to harmonize the process harmonize the format the business procedures um, uh, uh, and also the operational process in the end, we have a single tool for all the all the 38 plus TSOs, which is a, which is a challenging task. Mm. So I would really call this uh, OPC and STA mm, project as a uh, uh, success story from um, a TSO, RC, and SOE coordination perspective. So now we can say jointly developed tools, uniform norms, and standards of network operation um, can be truly implemented into practice. So that's the key. Um, I think it's really important to note the role of RSCs here in this development of this uh, both uh, both this OPC and STA. Um, here, the business process and the prototype of the um, tools were developed by by the um, RSCs, uh, TSC Net for the OPC process and um, STA for the uh, Coreso developed the STA process. So it's really important to note the um, the role of RSCs in uh, in the big picture. Um, from user point of view, this tool actually changed the changed the life. They changed the life in the control room. So before all the local tools of the TSOs were not connected to each other, they were doing the let's say the outage planning by manual exchange, uh, by email, etc. But now with these tools, um, it's it's really machine to machine interaction, and um, users can have a pan European view of the grid. So it really changed the life of the by the operators in the control room. Um, yeah, I think in the end, uh, which is this um, the tool need to serve the um, those who work in the control room and to make uh, effective decisions to manage the grid properly. So in the end, it uh, the tool serve the purpose. Um, of course, when we are talking about the tools for the largest technical system in the world, so. Of course, we need to use the best of class technology, digital technologies. So here you can see uh, the project uh, try to use open source components um, for the flexibility in the evolution and also um, key clock for the single sign on authentication component. Um, also try to use the uh, several um, infrastructure uh, kind of a reusability on the CGM investment, common grid model investment. Um, and um, with the use of the data streaming technology based on Kafka, um, also the scalability also uh, uh, can be done with these. Um, with the same integration, the IT security is um, improved and also the Kubernetes allowed the um, continuous deployment and continuous uh, integration with these. Yeah. Um, yeah, in all in all, in the end, IT security, flexibility and scalability and reusability is something um, uh, uh, really critical for from the IT infrastructure perspective. So these are well considered and implemented within the project. 
Um, from business point of view, I would like to uh, uh, take three key takeaways from this presentation. Um, uh, first thing, more and more pro process, more and more platforms. Are, will be interconnected with these uh, services. For example, ENSOI transparency platform is already interconnected with STA service, and in the next evolution, OPC and STA will be interconnected for a better data analysis and uh, uh, decision making possibilities. And the second aspect, the, the tool is not just implemented for the fulfilling legal requirements, it's also uh, 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 will support the needs of the operators in the control room with more and more features and visualizations etc also when the with the cep the clean energy package uh, further evolutions are expected in the opc and sta tools um, another aspect that is really key for the success of this process is that um, we are really talking about 38 tso's and six rses come together and what to create this process so um, one of the key aspect was um, the governance and the coordination platform that existed within the NSOE, RSC and TS, uh, TSO community was perfect for the implementation. I think this is something that is uh, we need to talk more and, uh, and need to be empowered in the future um, for the further success of these kind of projects. Yeah. Um, that's all from my side. Um, if you are more curious on the OPC and STA Pan European tools, you can check the YouTube videos uh, where myself and uh, Vedran from Corezo explain the OPC and uh, STA tools respectively. Um, yeah, uh, really thanks for your um, um, uh, for listening this uh, presentation, and I wish you a uh, good rest of the day. Bye. Outage planning coordination is one of the important services provided by the RSEs to TSOs. Coordinating the outages of thousands of grid elements in an interconnected European grid is not an easy task. That's why OPC Pan-European tool is built to serve outage planners. This tool makes the outage planning more efficient, precise and importantly fulfill legal requirements. The tool has four important functions. One is really the integrating all the availability plans from DSOs into this database, validation and quality check, official OPC merge, and output or output results. Daryl, in the following presentation, I will give you a short and quick uh, overview of some of the activities that Ellering has led in Europe in the area of consumer metadata access. I will talk about ESTFEED, the consent-based data exchange uh, platform, and the European Energy Data Access pilots, uh, which use the uh, uh, ESTFEED piloting environment for requesting and receiving mock metering data of different European countries. First of all, what is ESTFEED and how does it work? ESTFEED is a data transfer layer between data hubs, uh, so the information systems that store energy data and data users, like applications of energy services that want to access and process this data. On top of this data exchange or uh, data transfer layer, we have developed a consent management system that enables the end users, who are the owners of the data, to choose between the different services and then give them permissions to access their data stored in the data hubs. This is a very simplified visualization of ESTFEED's architecture and how the system uh, works. As background information, so in Estonia, we uh, went live in the end of 2017. Then in 2018, we started to collaborate with uh, Energinet and did our first European pilot uh, where we tested the exchange of metering data between Denmark and Estonia. Then in 2019, we started to convince other uh, European grid operators, which led to signing a letter of intent in the end of 2019, together with eight uh, other grid operators with the main intention to start discussing uh, how to manage energy data access on a European level. Uh, one of the outcomes or, or activities of this European collaboration is the European Energy Data Access piloting program that we started this year. Uh, so in this program, we pilot and test innovative energy products and services uh, that need metering data from different countries or who would like to provide their service in different countries. 
Uh, so this pro uh, program has had two main goals. First of all, to better understand uh, what are the businesses and what are the services that they provide and also what, are, what problems they are facing right now with uh, energy data access. Uh, and secondly, to feed this information as an input uh, for developing a Europe-wide energy data access, uh, access solution together with the, uh, the other grid operators. Uh, on the bottom of the slide, you can see logos of, uh, of the grid operators that su have supported our piloting activities and also provided mock metering data for our piloting environment. On the next slide, you can see the European pilots that have taken part in our, in our initiative. So we have uh, renewable energy trading platforms, renewable energy certificate marketplaces, uh, we have energy management systems for uh, business and home buildings, uh, we have uh, energy monitoring tools, uh, renewable energy investment calculators, and we also have a couple of uh, integration simplifiers, so tools and solutions that uh, uh, simplify access to already existing data hubs and data management systems. Uh, here you can see the timeline of the piloting activities. Uh, in uh, April we announced the competition, in May we selected the pilots, and in June we started with the technical and public kickoffs and with the technical integrations uh, of the uh, information systems and applications of the pilots. Uh, as a background activity, uh, from 2019 uh, we already started a kind of market research uh, and during this research we have studied and, and interviewed uh, over 50 uh, energy services uh, that uh, need metering data in, in providing their products and, and services to their clients. So we are now uh, putting together a report uh, with uh, what will give uh, an overview of the different services that need energy data, uh, what is the data that they're specifically interested in, what are their problems right now with data access and also what are the workarounds, so how do they access the data at this time being. Uh, in the end of December or early uh, beginning of January we'll have a final event uh, where we uh, mainly focus on, on the demos uh, of the pilots and also their learning points and challenges with the integrations and with the energy data access, but there will also uh, present uh, this, uh, this report that I just mentioned a few seconds ago. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, please do visit our uh, webpage stv.eu where you can find more information about the pilots and also the coming events and also the report will be published on this website. Thank you very much. So huge thanks to our key experts in, in the area. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Jeram. And now let's continue with the discussion. So we have um, a couple of questions, not, not only a couple, uh, actually uh, many more, uh, that, that are posted on Slido. And, and as in the, in the morning, uh, we also had a, uh, had a presentation about uh, about open source and, and how, t uh, how, how open source would benefit uh, data exchange and data formats and, and, and the uh, software used in, in uh, the TSO coordination cooperation uh, activities, then I would, I would start with this question. So um, the, the, the experts talked about the different platforms that are, that are used in, uh, in TSO environment and our RSC environment. So uh, do you see that any of those could be an open source solution? And I would like Jeram actually to start, if, if you agree with me, of course, because you mentioned uh, a bit of open source in, in your presentation. So continue, please. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. Uh, in the morning, I was listening to the presentation from the RT colleague about the advantages of open source. Um, indeed, um, in the STN OPC project, um, there are two key open source um, uh, components that are used. Um, one is uh, uh, especially the 
engine for the system, uh, the advocacy calculation, which is Antara's advocacy models, which was uh, also used for the STA process. And uh, uh, the another aspect that were used is uh, the uh, part uh, developed by the RTE International, um, which has a, uh, which is something that is really close to me because we use also for the OPC process. Um, uh, maybe let me explain that. So uh, I think this advantages of using this let's coordinate is that um, this component can be taken for multiple other TSOs or RSCs in their local process itself. And there is a huge potential of, uh, you know, uh, connecting with this uh, uh, same uh, same components in their uh, processes. So uh, in the end, it's not just uh, um, uh, from the business point of view or the user point of view. The main advantage is that um, uh, the user doesn't need to deal with uh, multiple tools. Uh, there's uh, one common tool, co one common component, which can be made connected to the multiple processes. So it's just uh, something not just uh, on the infrastructure level, but also on the user point of view, it's something really, uh, really beneficial. Uh, and I think it's also a, quite an opportunity here where all the TSOs, uh, I don't know, all the energy stakeholders are here, can uh, take a look what are these open source components used and maybe could be possibly to, to integrate in their uh, tools, et cetera. Yeah, that's it uh, maybe from my side. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jeram, uh, Oliver, uh, Eric. Do you have any thoughts so related to your platforms yeah. and tools? How yeah. how does open source benefit there, or or maybe even bring some challenges? It it might not always benefit. Yeah, first of all, uh, maybe on the open source, what I would say is that uh, uh, the open source does not uh, prevent from using a standard. So it means that okay, we uh, can have uh, tools that are open source but you still uh, need to use the uh, data exchange uh, standards. And also the second thing is that in our job of, uh, the, of standardization in NSUI, we provide code components that are open in terms of, uh, I mean, the source code is open and that can be used in uh, many uh, different tools. So we are really also in this, uh, in this move of uh, open source uh, where we provide code components that can be uh, reused by different tools, like Jay was saying, from tools that are in the central platform and tools in the TSOs, for example. Thank you, Oliver. Eric, what are, what are your thoughts? I can indeed, I, I can confirm what is already said. Huh? So um, the, the, the complete STA OPC applications, they are built on open source components uh, coming from TSOs. Uh, if you look at Let's Coordinate or Antares, and on the other side, they're also coming from the communities. And, and we strongly believe at NSOE in the usage of open source, but supported components. Huh? So we are not looking into obscure things which, which arrive sometimes, but we really go for the, for the main uh, building blocks which are available and which are supported and integrated by uh, normal TSO companies. Thank you, thank you all. So let's continue with another interesting question. Uh, that is actually a more broader question and we could most probably discuss about it for uh, for several hours. But let's see, maybe, maybe you can raise... Uh, so a couple of uh, problems or points. So what do you think? So what are the main one to two problems with data availability on your platforms to support regional coordination and cooperation in, in your focus areas? And uh, let's now start with, uh, with uh, Olivier. So uh, the question is on the data availability. Uh, exactly. So, yeah, so basically, uh, for the standard, so when you want to provide the data, uh, make the data available, you need to have a, a data exchange format so that uh, many stakeholders can use uh, the same data or a service provider can uh, use the data in different uh, member states. And there is uh, today an initiative uh, from uh, the European Commission to do some implementing acts on uh, data access and, uh, and data interoperability. And it is a very important uh, uh, it's very important to, to follow this uh, from, from, from close because 
uh, the uh, European Commission will uh, make uh, enforce some uh, new rules for uh, interoperability. Uh, NSUI and the DSOs are part of this initiative uh, in the drafting team, so we have a key role here uh, to uh, have uh, the, the correct uh, triggers to enable the interoperability for uh, access uh, to data, so for uh, the data availability. Mm. So I understand interoper interoperability and data availability that you, you brought out the two main, main problems. Uh, Eric, Jairam, what are your thoughts? So one to two problems in, in your focus area on data availability. Mm, maybe I will add one point from the outreach planning perspective. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I think I, it's a very simple example and uh, I think it's very relevant. So outreach planning is something that's uh, really common for um, TSOs and DSOs. So now you can see um, the TSO side. Um, we have uh, harmonized the format and the working principles and we have a common tool. Uh, but uh, if you check on the DSO side, it's uh, I think they are progressing and with the EU DSO and the further movements coming from their side, this will be a So I think the, uh, the challenge here is also that it's not that also TSO side we harmonized. There is also a big collaboration effort and uh, um, uh, need to connect with the generator side and also on the DSO side to, to reach let's say the full potential. And it's gonna be a challenging exercise, uh, especially from the business point of view to harmonize all this for process and uh, all the business practices there. So maybe I would I would really say that this is one, one uh, challenge for TSO community in coming, uh, coming years to really uh, harmonize the format between generators and also the DSOs, uh, especially from the outage planning perspective, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank I, you. I can add what uh, will become really. What I yes. can add is what will become really challenging, is the amount of data that we have to process and, and that we have to get on the destinations where it uh, where it is needed, and together with the security aspects. Uh, so we are talking here about a lot of confidential data. So we really have to be able to label all this data, give it a, a, a clear security qualification that this data can also be uh, transferred without any, any risks. Hmm. So as, as, it, as in my area where, where, uh, where I work with consumer meter data access and there it's, uh, it's quite uh, it's settling. I would say that the, uh, the environment is, is getting clearer and clearer because the, the last uh, clean energy package and the electricity directive clearly uh, talks about and sets some regulation on, on, on the role of, uh, of data operators or TSOs and DSOs who, who store data and how they have to make this data accessible to end users. But what about, the, what about in your more um, technical or, or more um, core areas of, of TSO services? So, uh, and as as this is not anymore, uh, or quite often it can be personal data, but quite often it's also not personal, but more private data, which is, which is company related. So what are there the, uh, the main challenges? Uh, as, uh, as Eric a little bit already mentioned, that, uh, that it is quite sensitive data, but how to then, how to secure that, uh, that it will be exchanged uh, on a secure, and, and uh, based on a regulative, uh, yes, requirements. So how to ensure this? Can you, can you, can you somehow name how, or, or bring out some points, how your platforms uh, deal with these kind of issues, so security issues, and uh, that are related with private data sharing? We will start with Eric this time. Yes, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So indeed, I already already mentioned confidentiality, security, but it's also about integrity. Yeah? So to make sure that the data is not tampered with and that everybody can trust the data that they receive from the other parties. 
Um, Echo SP is especially meant for this, as I already uh, explained during the presentation, with uh, authentication and, and encrypting uh, we have in place there. Uh, we're already looking further. Eh? So we, we started last week two projects to look, okay, is there any need or any useful need for, for blockchain, for example? certainly to uh, to guarantee the integrity of the data that we are transferring uh, we're looking into quantum computing uh, not to use it but what is the risk uh, what is the risk if tomorrow somebody can use this to decrypt uh, our messages without without uh, issues uh, so um, yes we are following uh, closely what is happening there and how we can um, solve these uh, this common issues any additional thoughts Oliver, Jerem, or I can take the ne qu next question as well if you if you like. Okay. Yeah, maybe I will add one point um, from the uh, user's perspective. I think um, I think uh, this data exchange uh, is something um, from users how they see is that uh, the more and more secure uh, part, um, they are all all the business users are really ready to follow. But I think uh, we see more at some of a, of a technical problem to solve in the sense that uh, if you add more technical layers or security layers in terms of data exchange, uh, I think the, the users in the room or RSEs and TSOs are, are happy to evolve or adapt to the needs of the securities. So maybe this is one point I would like to highlight here. Mm -hmm. uh, great, thank you. So. Um I was also thinking, thinking a little bit back and, and uh, connecting the topics that have been discussed uh, on this, on this uh, web conference today. So what about interoperability? There, there are a lot of discussions that uh, we should make different systems and platforms. And NSOE talks a lot about platform or, uh, systems of systems and platforms of platforms. And, and, uh, and my question here, or a question uh, here posted on Slido, is that um, so what is the rationale? Is, is there, uh, it's always nice maybe to make things interoperable because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's trendy, but what would you say are the main benefits of, uh, uh, interop of making the platforms that we talked here today, making them interoperable? So are there any clear benefits or, 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 or opportunities that you could highlight? what you would benefit from yeah. making these systems interoperable? So, so the first um, reason we can think about when we think about interoperability is uh, to decrease uh, the cost. Uh, so we try to make uh, things interoperable so that we can decrease the cost. Uh, but when we see the network codes and the clean energy package and the complexity of the system where we are working in, uh, actually, uh, the interoperability is is not only for the cost; it's it's a must to make things work. Uh, because if you don't have the, the inter uh, just the pan-European uh, system or platforms, they will don't they don't have the proper data and they they cannot even work. So it's it's uh, I would say um, maybe in the past it was more for the cost. No, it's just to make them work to to have the interoperability. So here for the data exchange. Uh, the ontology, so the the, the myth of what you send uh, in the data, uh, you uh, need to understand what the TSOs are sending, for example, in a common platform, or what um, uh, the uh, consumer are sending to the TSOs. Uh, you need to understand. We need to understand what what uh, they mean and what is, uh, is is there. So the interoperability now it's uh, it's uh, it's a pre prerequisite, I would say. Mm. Any other great ideas? Why why your platform or why your tools could benefit from interfacing or interfacing with uh, with the other platforms and tools that we mentioned here today? Well, you, you see that uh, the TSO business becomes more and more integrated. Uh, in the past, you had uh, the security of supply and you had the, the, the market systems, which were individual systems they didn't have to connect to each other now with, uh, with flow-based market coupling you see a clear link between the two and they have to be able to communicate 
share data, and that's that's where we need the interoperability. That's in one direction where you have uh, applications providing different uh, business capabilities that need to interact with each other. And on the other side, you see that these platforms are more and more distribute. Uh, you see it already at the TSO, eh, where, the, where the, the business model is completely changing. You see it with the RSCs, you see it with the pan-European projects. So to avoid that we have to uh, redevelop every tool again and again, it's, it's very important to implement new functionality in existing tools and platforms. And, and for this, you need this interoperability. Uh, so indeed, like Olivier already said, this, this will be a big cost saver as we, the, the idea is not to, to every time when you have a new requirement to build a new tool, but just to integrate that functionality in your existing tools and let those existing tools communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. um, I will add one point here. I think um, our our whole TSOK or all the energy community, our main goal is to have maintain the security of supply and then you know uh, well functioning of internal energy market. So in the long time frame, ten year plan to five year plan, two year plan, yearly outage planning or yearly operational planning, what we do on the monthly basis for the markets or um, uh, D minus seven, D minus three, these are all very uh, all interconnected. Whatever we take decision on yearly planning is really connected to the real time operation. So, in my in my eyes, from operator point of operation point of view, um, the interoperability or interconnectivity between the process and system is it's not anymore an option. It's really should be the standard. And uh, I can imagine in five or ten years, we are really talking about all the processes interconnecting and. Uh, understanding the impact, impacts of a weak herd process and the D minus two capacity calculation. So um, I think um, there's a really good exercise we did in our uh, business group for a 10 year planning of uh, our, our business part. And one of the clear outcome was to really reach out to all the process to connect each other, to understand the impacts of uh, each other processes and empower the operators in the control room to make better decisions. So, so yeah, uh, I think we should we should be really talking about more of a mandatory part uh, on the interconnectivity. Thank you. Yes. So, from from my perspective, and as I as I work and uh, as I as I work a lot with the, with the different innovative services that want to access consumer meter data. So every day, uh, not every day, but uh, most of the time, when I talk with the innovators or the service providers, then they they are interested also in other sorts of data. So other sorts of grid data, outage uh, outage data, uh, capacity data. Uh, active and, and reactive energy data. So, so that is uh, what I see that they would be interested and, and they usually are service providers who have one or, or two applications or information systems and they, they would like to make one integration. So for them, it would be much easier to interface with one system and then get access to the different data or information stored in the different platforms and tools than to interface with all of them. So this is a this is again also a quite huge topic that I would not go further into, but uh, as uh, as our time is 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 ending here with with this session, so I would I would like you all to think about what would be the one main idea that you would like the the participants of this session, so the the ones who were listening, to take with them uh, today. So what is the main, main one main idea that you would like? people to remember afterwards. And let's, let's start with, uh, with Olivier. So the, the main idea, I would say uh, that the common information model, so the SIM, uh, can be used for any project uh, for electricity in Europe, and uh, that includes any project that includes the data exchange. Uh, it enables uh, interoperability uh, through Europe. Uh, so don't hesitate to contact us or to liaise with uh, your SIM expert group member uh, to uh, to see how we can uh, uh, support this uh, activity of standardization. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Eric. 
your main idea? Well, we, we, we see that uh, coordination and cooperation becomes really key uh, in the RSC world. Uh, so it's already mentioned, but interoperability really becomes key to make, to make this possible. And so we should really focus on having these first these standards, but also to having these, uh, these components available uh, to the community um, that uh, will make this, uh, this interoperability possible. Thank you, Eric. Jeram, what's, what's your main, main point that you would like people to remember from today's session? Uh, for my side, I would say that um, the jointly developed tools creating common standards or pan-European services running 24-7 um, is something that it's already implemented in practice very successfully. So, so I would say this is, this is, uh, this is really possible, uh, the, the TSO, RSC and SOE coordination and thing that is uh, really working well. And uh, I think this ST and OPC tools are uh, good uh, examples uh, of this coordination yeah thank you so from my side uh, my main idea would be to so for all the tso dso environment to to start more collaborating with with the innovative services that are there on the market because i of course i understand that there are the core services that the tso's dso's rsc uh, provide but there are definitely uh, many other very innovative energy services that enable us to actually reach the goals of, of EU, the renewable energy and climate goals of EU. So more discussion. So we already discuss a, a lot with uh, DSOs and, and market, like common market participants, uh, suppliers, uh, grid operators, uh, line managers, but to start the discussion also with, with the, uh, the great ideas and the great idea providers from the, from the private sector who come up with great ideas how to, how to involve more the consumer, how to involve more the other businesses around and, and make a, enable us to, to uh, achieve the European climate and energy goals. So thank you very much for the, for the experts and the presenters. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very grateful for you. I'm, I got a lot of new knowledge and I also hope also the, the listeners to this uh, session, session um, found, found new ideas and got some new points that they could elaborate uh, afterwards. So thank you. Thank you very much for everyone in the parallel sessions and I hope you've uh, found your way back now to the main venue, to the main virtual space where we will continue with a more political angle, if, uh, if I may. Now we'll move to um, the next keynote speech from the Minister of Energy uh, for, of Luxembourg, Mr. Claude Tourmes. The floor is yours, sir. Uh, it's my, my pleasure to, uh, to open today with us uh, this important conference. So where are we uh, in, uh, in the TSO business? So first, I think we have to understand uh, the next 10 years are the only 10 years where we still can win uh, the run against uh, dangerous climate change. Uh, the good news is that we have a good run. We have a good run because in US... Uh, we are replacing in these weeks uh, a climate skeptic uh, close to Koch brothers and other oil interests uh, by uh, Biden, who is uh, really somebody who is personally convinced that climate change is the biggest threat to humanity. And he will move US in a completely different direction, which is good for the global uh, mood. In Europe... Uh, the new Commission President von der Leyen has finally done what her predecessor Juncker should already have done, which is moving Europe from 40% uh, uh, greenhouse gas reduction in 2030 to 55 and beyond. Uh, 
this is a, a necessary and a step which took maybe too long, but now it's there. This will be, uh, uh, this can only function if we have a strengthened ETS, so curl we go out of the system much quicker, and if we have a much, much faster deployment of renewables. And there is a third uh, reason why I'm optimistic, uh, especially in Europe, and that optimism comes from you, uh, because together with you, uh, legislators and also regulators, uh, we have built up the most sophisticated electricity, not only market, which exists in the world, but also the most uh, uh, sophisticated way of exchanging electricity, uh, not only in the EU, but even beyond the EU, uh, when I think uh, to important uh, countries like uh, Switzerland, which is in the middle of our system, and also uh, Norway. So, um, Biden... Uh, van der Leyen, and then uh, the, the, this historic achievement of the last decades uh, of our sophisticated system uh, of, of transmission system operators of electricity markets. This has, of course, been built up on security of supply and optimizing the trading. And now I think I hope that you are aware that there is, uh, be beyond these two, which will stay important, there is a third kit in the, in the game, which is renewable energy. Uh, solar electricity, small scale, big scale, onshore wind, uh, big scale, and offshore wind, very big scale, uh, will have to be deployed as fast as possible. We cannot uh, really electrify more parts of society, like heating and transport, if we don't first uh, really roll out the renewables. And Hydrogen doesn't make any sense if it does not come one-to-one -one from renewable electricity with electrolyzers. So uh, the next years we must bring a fantastic acceleration of renewables and that is of course only possible if you as transmission system operators are also helping us to get this done. So, and we have to do this at three uh, levels. One is the national level. Uh, I will not go to a lot of details. You know what you have to do at your national level. And I'm extremely pleased that I have with Creos Transmission in Luxembourg an operator which is fully embracing electromobility, uh, the, the more electricity into the heating system, and of course all the upgrading, which that implies also on the uh, higher voltage uh, level. Um, the next level important is of course the, the European level. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, bringing the, the right infrastructure on the right place in the right time. Uh, and uh, so we will have a lot of money on the table with the Green Deal, uh, take a profit of that uh, to accelerate uh, maybe investments which have been stalled uh, over, over the last years. Uh, then the second thing is, I think that beneath classic uh, grid building, um, we face all kinds of innovation which we see now with uh, IT coming to, to uh, our, or the, or your, your business sector, which means de facto more intelligence uh, and maybe less copper. Uh, and so we have to embrace all uh, intelligent uh, so system solutions which are now popping up and also which are provided by new companies, by, by new know-how, and, and this has to be fully integrated uh, into, uh, into the rollout or the modernization uh, of the system. And then, of course, uh, this has to be built on robust scenarios, and I'm really pleased and, uh, that uh, Laurent and his team uh, from NCOE, that they have really uh, gone much better on the scenarios. Uh, the, the, uh, and on the scenarios, before it was incremental, a bit of more renewables, I think now we are really in the moment. Uh, we have to, to uh, plan for the final game. The pl final game is 100% renewables in an electricity system where demand will be higher than today. So which is a huge challenge. It's doable and it's great that uh, you have this ambition uh, tools and because we need ambition and uh, these scenarios uh, must really be robust and must be uh, parallel to what really we need in the climate change, which is uh, a decarbonization, 100% renewables as early 
as, uh, as, uh, as possible. Um, good, and then the other level is, of course, the regional level. Um, the regional level is extremely important because uh, Europe is, in a certain sense, almost too big uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to be able to run the race uh, uh, all together. So I think Scandinavia and uh, Western Europe will, 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 be, will be able to, to run uh, even quicker into the direction of 100% of uh, renewables, also the, the Iberic uh, uh, island. And so for that we need, of course, to, to bring now to life what has been negotiated uh, in the last market design uh, regulation and a directive, which is the regional security centers. Uh, so, and, and, and then also uh, doing all kinds of, of uh, cross-border TSO cooperation. And I'm proud uh, with uh, my team, especially Simeon Hackspiel, uh, to, to be able to be a, a, an active uh, player in the pentilateral uh, cooperation. Uh, we have uh, provided for much clearer ideas about what kind of grid we need in the in the North Sea, uh, which uh, so I think everything up north from Belgium is is we have a, a good view of what we have to do. We will still have to work a bit with uh, Ireland, France, uh, and and Belgium to to see what we do in the southern part. Uh, of the North Sea and, and I think the TSOs of these countries should think much more actively of what kind of mesh grid we can get into that part and of course you have uh, seen that we have also now this Baltic cooperation which I have uh, called for for 10 years and it's great that it's now up and running and Poland uh, and the three Baltic states will of course play uh, a big uh, role of that. Um, and then uh, I think the other thing which we are now concentrating in the pentalateral is beyond trying to have a binding agreement on the security of supply, how we help each other, which is in the making. The other question which we have to address now is um, trucks and electromobility. So uh, probably there will be earlier in the market electric trucks than hydrogen trucks. Uh, which means that uh, they will, we will have big charges at certain uh, depot level. Uh, we will have to think about uh, the, 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 the multi, uh, the, the, the nodes of, of the, the logistic nodes, uh, the big cities, the harbors, uh, where, where, where railways uh, uh, are in multi mode, where, where the, the lorries come and then are provided uh, over to, to the railway, and of course. Uh, we need to, to understand where on the highways uh, we need to have uh, super nodes uh, with chargers. Uh, and you know, this is not about 150 uh, uh, kilowatts. This is probably uh, 1.2 megawatt, 1.5 megawatt charging. Uh, you imagine, and I have two or three of the largest filling stations in Luxembourg. Uh, so, so we are now anticipating that we will have to have uh, I don't know, 10, 10 15 fast chargers, uh, four lorries, and then of course maybe a, a bit of a slower system for during the night, but all this adds of course enormous loads and we need to anticipate this in order to bring the power uh, to these areas. A last word on hydrogen. There is a bit of a hydrogen hype. Uh, personally, I'm, I, I think we have to be realistic. Hydrogen will be very expensive. Uh, and therefore, it's, it's uh, a bit like champagne. You don't uh, drink it from morning uh, to the evening. You drink it at certain uh, occasions. So hydrogen will be uh, uh, fuel for very specific areas where we can't electrify much cheaper and much faster. Uh, and in that sense, um, let's, let's be realistic about hydrogen. And, but what, what is really important? The electrolyzers uh, must be placed uh, close to where we have the big renewables. And you have an important role uh, now with policymakers and regulators to identify which kind of tools uh, do we need to get a locational signal to get the electrolyzers where we have the renewables uh, in order to, to have this complementarity uh, with uh, the grid. And then as a second uh, step, we will have to think about a uh, pure hydrogen backbone uh, from certain regions and, and what is probably the most promising is uh, Spain and Portugal which have uh, solar for 10-15 uh, 
uh, Eurocent, uh, that's the areas where, where you can provide hydrogen for uh, 1.5 uh, euro per kilogram so so that is where you have competitive hydrogen and then the question is of course how can we bring this hydrogen through france to germany benelux uh, and and maybe also uh, from from tunisia morocco so this kind of thinking has to be integrated also into the electricity grid planning a huge challenge but i know you are dedicated uh, you are professionals and I, with, often in my discussions with you, I feel also that you have understood what an important role you play uh, in getting uh, this planet not uh, overheated and, and keeping this blue planet, which is the only one we have, uh, a viable, uh, thrilling, a good place to live. Thank you very much. Minister Turmes, thank you so much for this very passionate keynote. Uh, the Blue Planet is indeed something we'd all love to preserve and uh, the questions coming from the audience address the challenges in keeping it uh, nice and blue. Now, um, developing offshore requires effective regional coordination. I guess everyone agrees with that. Now, uh, Minister, do you think that the current regional settings, the RSCs, Pentilateral Energy Forum, etc., are efficient? No, I think we, um, we have to be even more efficient. Um, what is good in, in the new um, uh, communication of EU Commission is that we have now identified the challenge. Uh, the challenge is... Uh, uh, all about uh, 300 gigawatt plus. So uh, I think if we take uh, the British uh, capacity within, pr probably we have to be nearer to 450 than to 300 uh, gigawatt. Uh, that means, of course, that it's, it is no more a single project thinking. We need uh, to map out uh, for every sea basin, the North Sea, the Baltic Sea, the Black Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, we need to, to know where will, can that happen. Uh, therefore, maritime spatial planning will, will have much more uh, importance in future. And then, of course, uh, grids will not be point to point, but there will be at least partially mesh grids. There will be energy islands. Uh, so we have to learn from these first fantastic experiences in Krieger's Flock, uh, the other big uh, pro two projects which uh, the Danish uh, are doing uh, to to really anticipate uh, that that this will be a completely different thinking, and of course uh, for the TSOs which are which will be concerned, that is a completely new way of thinking, and uh, so we need uh, to be open to to organizational innovations, uh, and we need to to talk to each other. So it is the the, the wind developers the grid developers, the regulators, the policy makers. Uh, I think we have also to listen to uh, the, the, the banking community, what under which conditions can we get uh, cheap financing for this kind of complex projects and then move ahead. Um, the second question is, I guess, a very appropriate one for a politician. Now, how do you build up public support for the necessary infrastructure projects? Um, I think on one hand, uh, climate change has got now a dimension that I would say, at least in Europe, an overwhelming part of, of our societies understand that this is the big challenge. And therefore, they will have more general understanding for building up uh, infrastructure. However, when we build up infrastructure, I think we need... Um, transparent planning. We have to tell people um, why we do certain uh, infrastructure. And then, of course, we need to have uh, really good um, also landscape architects. So, so uh, if we build onshore grid, uh, I think there is today uh, technology uh, there. So you can do undergrounding, you can have uh, different shapes of, of, uh, of, of mass, so, uh, and, and then we, we need really to be probably much more sophisticated in, uh, in, in getting solutions in those places 
where you get closer to 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 uh, to a village or where, where you need them to 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 adapt. Um, Good and then of course uh, mini turtle. Uh, so so uh, transformators uh, twenty years ago had uh, were different than today. So I think we will also have uh, technological innovation, and we should not uh, forget about all the options which IT uh, intelligence brings to us. So when I say in my my opening remarks, it's all about also uh, being as intelligent as possible and. Even if we will need copper, uh, we should be aware that uh, more intelligence and less copper is probably uh, where the show will go. Well, the next question addresses uh, the concerns on the, over the pandemic. Now, we've seen industrial production being stalled. Uh, construction has definitely slowed down in, in some areas. Do you think, uh, can the pandemic uh, slow down the implementation of uh, major investment projects? But I think in the in, in March and April, um, all governments were were so surprised uh, that uh, basically they did uh, lockdowns which were too severe. There was one big error was closing the borders, uh, and that has of course uh, in a field like uh, electricity uh, where you have a lot of cross border suppliers uh, that has. Uh, really been a blow uh, to and and uh, to to certain projects and and we have lost some time. In the second uh, wave of Corona, you have seen that governments that we have tried to learn from errors. Uh, we keep the borders open. We set. I think construction industry has. I think in all countries uh, been kept open. So I think we have largely uh, resolved uh, that uh, that that problem. Um, and uh, a pandemic shows, of course, uh, vulnerability of humankind uh, to, uh, uh, to, to nature. And uh, I hope that this is also helping us in bridging over to climate change. Uh, so, so I think we have to respect nature in order to, uh, to, to, uh, to not to, to, over, uh, to go over the boundaries of, of uh, natural systems. Minister, thank you so much for joining us. We would uh, have uh, more questions for you, but as Estonians, we find it extremely disturbing to go over the time schedule. So uh, <laughs> apologies for uh, leaving it here. Thank you once again. Don't worry. Thank you, and uh, thank you for organizing this important conference. <laughs> As our first speaker, the Honourable Kadri Simson already highlighted this morning, speaking not far from Luxembourg, from Brussels, renewables are good news for the planet, but at the same time, they also bring challenges for the system operators, as they are, well, less stable, decentralised and far away from consumption centres. Joachim Van Zetta, who is the chair of the board of NSOE, will talk about European and regional coordination to enable the green transition. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Joachim van Zetter. I'm the chair of the board of NSOE. I would like to welcome you also very warmly to this conference, RSC 2020, which the first time in the history is done on a digital way. And it is done on a digital way due to COVID-19. This crisis was really unforeseeable for Europe um, and I think there is nothing good on this pandemic, but maybe there is one aspect I would like to raise, that is that the TSOs and the RSCs and their staff demonstrate in 24-7 their dedication, their willingness and their capability to maintain the electricity system secure, to keep the lights on. And that is a good message, good news uh, during this pandemic uh, event. Despite the circumstances, European TSOs remain equally committed to support the so-called Green Deal from the European Commission and the digital transition. To reach climate neutrality will require to invest in the physical grid and to invest also into a digital layer on top of it. In the morning we will show you how TSOs invest in innovative digital regional services and tools. In the afternoon you will hear about to build connections between large and remote energy sources from renewables and consumption centers and among different sectors. 
The green transition will also require even more coordination and cooperation between distribution and transmission, between the operators of the systems, between sectors within the regions and over the regions beyond. It will require for all of us to do our job and to play our part. The cooperation is essential, but not only for the TSOs, but also on the regional level, on the member state and on the regulatory level. We see great of such cooperation through the Baltic Energy Market Integration and Interconnection Plan and the According Synchronization Project. And I want to give my compliments especially to the Baltic TSOs uh, to facilitate that they are facilitating this great project for resynchronization and for synchronization with the European Interconnected System. Today I will present how TSOs cooperate in regions and uh, at the European level in order to enable the Green Deal and the European digital transition. Um, before I come to the TSO efforts, let me just shortly and briefly go to the RSCs, because the TSOs develop IT tools uh, and services which are operated by the RSCs in order to foster our cooperation and in order to uh, support the work of the TSOs. Through these services, the RSC support TSOs in enabling to keep the lights on and to reach the European climate goals. And I have three examples for you what the, the RSCs are doing already today or will do in the very near future. The first is uh, the short-term adequacy service. And with this service, the RSCs support the renewable energy sources integration, which might be even more important for the future where we have not that coal and gas fired power plants anymore on the grid, maybe also less nuclear power plants and where we need to work and to deal with the highly volatile uh, renewable energy sourcing and feeds and also in times of uh, where there is no energy from wind or from uh, solar. In Germany we call that Dunkelflaute. With the common grid model, that is our second example, and the capacity calculation services, um, the RSCs support a more efficient use of the existing grid and they contribute with this to meet the interconnection targets of the European Commission and the European legislation. And thirdly, the uh, RSCs are an integral part to ensure a general increase of system security through the cooperation on uh, on their regional levels and on their services. And one example I want to mention, because this is uh, you know, nearly implemented now and just done uh, already in some of the RSCs, is the so-called uh, outage planning cooperation, where the TSOs coordinate their outage planning, their plant maintenances uh, within their grid through this tool of the RSCs. So RSCs play a very important role in the cooperation but also the TSOs support the green transition and the green deal um, in different projects and targets. And I have again three examples for that, how the European TSO cooperation is supporting progress towards meeting the European climate goals. Let me first um, present the so-called 10-year network development plan, the TYNDP. This TYNDP fosters the achievement of the RS RES integration targets through its scenarios and the 10-year network development plan also builds a basis for the interconnection targets it needs to have higher renewable energy shares requires additional infrastructure at the right spot in the grid to exchange the fluctuating uh, energy from uh, renewable energies between individual countries but that is uh, maybe not enough we are facing also um, the uh, need for a so-called multi-sectoral planning support in the 10-year network development plan procedure. And that is my example num number two. The, the MSPS, the multi-sectoral planning support, fosters energy efficiency and enables even a higher penetration and a higher integration of renewable energies through a smart sector integration that begins at the planning process already. So we hope with this we will have in, in the future less offshore curtailment through, for example, um, giving the energy not to the grid but to the so-called power to gas uh, sector uh, integration and uh, to transfer the electricity into the gas uh, grids. 
This will increase efficiency in a one system view by uh, enabling us not to curtail any wind generation anymore coming from the offshore wind generators. The third example is the so-called NSOE RDI roadmap. RDI stands for, for Research and Development Roadmap, where we have defined, discussed and uh, focused on so-called six flagship projects addressing key challenges for the future of the power system especially enabling smart sector integration, the operation of widespread AC and DC, we call it hybrid grids, and the offshore wind generation will be key and issue for the next decades in order to ensure uh, that our uh, energy system, our electricity system will stay uh, safe and uh, secure as you are used to it. This are uh, uh, important uh, projects and also um, publications, which you can see also on the NSOE web page. Please have a look at it. Furthermore, <clears throat> I want to focus uh, on one specific issue, and that is the offshore grid development, which NSOE contributes to the debate of the development of the offshore renewable energy in Europe. In uh, recent position papers, we have identified five pillars to make offshore development uh, a European success story. First of all, we need for these uh, European offshore grids a holistic planning and a coordinated development of an offshore and onshore transmission system because they only can work together and therefore we need a holistic approach for that. Secondly, we need a modular stepwise approach combining different technologies and grid designs based on consistent planning methods. We need more than an interoperability for smarter integrated and secure system operations of these uh, hybrid grids. Fourthly, we need to leverage innovation to keep the costs low and to keep the environmental footprint for the, uh, ex for the, um, for the extension of our uh, offshore grid also low. So we want to keep the environmental footprint low and therefore we need uh, innovation in that too. And finally, five, fifth point is to develop a future-proof regulatory framework which is consistent and which has uh, to provide unbundling rules for offshore and onshore, which gives incentives for investments in our grid, which uh, set up uh, and ensures confidence in the market and in the system operation and which gives flexible rules for hybrid projects. TSOs already discussed so-called offshore bidding zones, and they might be a promising solution for the future, in instance. The RSC themselves will have to play a, cru a crucial role to support a secure integration of large offshore grid generation uh, into the European existing European power system. In this, perspec in this perspective, sorry, I look forward to my colleague Tarvid's keynote speech on the Baltic Sea Offshore Wind Initiative, which will be the next agenda point. Before giving Tarvid the floor, let me please conclude what I have said so far. The motto of NSOE is acting locally, coordinate regionally and cooperate at the European level. And this motto will continue to be the right formula as we progress towards a greener and a smarter power system. The TSOs, which are supported by the RSEs and which are cooperating in NSOE, the TSOs stand ready to be the key facilitators for one energy system of interconnected system in a collaboration with DSOs and in a dialogue with all the stakeholders, putting the energy customers at the center and proving efficiency and effectiveness of the energy system. The RSCs are the success story of the TSO regional cooperation. They are the major building block of the European power system transformation in the regions. We are looking forward to another occasion to exchange with you, with our stakeholders and with our colleagues during this RSC conference and thank our Baltic colleagues and the Baltic TSOs for organi organizing the RSC conference 2020 in these difficult circumstances, hoping that in the next year we will might meet physically again. 
Thank you very much and have uh, interesting uh, insights and uh, also discussions. Thank you very much, Joachim. Before I invite Davi onto the stage, allow me to ask a few questions. And uh, it's my pleasure that you're joining us over the phone. Joachim, what do you think are the biggest challenges in relation to offshore for the power transmission system in Europe? Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, unfortunately, um, it's not possible for me today to dial in my computer. Therefore, I did it by phone. I hope you can hear me uh, good. So digitalization is a, a challenge, <laughs> I can only say, because we had a, a major uh, provider uh, out um, here in Germany um, for now one and a half days. So uh, we are lacking on that. So I hope uh, I can answer the question anyway. Yeah, offshore uh, for the power transition system uh, in Europe is, uh, I think, um, one of the key elements for getting our, our climate uh, greener and for um, uh, coming to a neutral approach on that. Um, I think we, not, we do not have one challenge. We have uh, some of them. First of all, what, what I mentioned in my speech is costs. You know, we have to make massive investments and somebody has to pay for it. So we need investors uh, for offshore wind power generation as well for off and onshore transmission infrastructure for the lines and cables uh, and also for those who are building the windmills. And uh, that is something... Uh, um, which have to come from investors and for these necessary investments financial security is needed and stranded investments have to be avoided and there must be a, um, a regulatory framework which uh, at least um, yeah, guarantees that there will be uh, um, a cashback of the money which has to be invested. Another point I mentioned also is the spatial planning. If you want to build up to 450 gigawatt of offshore wind capacity up to 2050 um, and that is what uh, the European Commission uh, ambition is, as you heard from Kathy Simpson in the morning, but she said about 3,400 terawatt hours, so she focused on the energy. But you need a lot of installations in uh, installed capacity. And uh, there, um, the space available for the cable routing and for landing points, as well as for onshore networks, is uh, expected to begin to become yeah, scarcer and scarcer. So therefore, we need a co co coordinated maritime and offshore planning uh, uh, for uh, realizing these investments and these projects. The third point uh, I want to mention is the integrated perspective over time, space, and sectors. The main load centers, we know all, they are still uh, uh, there where they were, and uh, they will not transform. So uh, they are far away from offshore generation. The solutions for integrated development and operation of the offshore and onshore transmission grid and solution for market design must ensure the overall affordability and the sustainability, the security, the timeless and reliability of power supplies. That is absolutely crucial and essential. We cannot you know, come to a system where we have, we have from time to time or day to day blackouts, you know, like in uh, in, in the IT network uh, today, like we saw it. So this is not possible for us, and we have to over, overcome also pandemic situations, as I said before. Uh, and therefore, we need to to put system security and security of supply at the top of our uh, priorities for that uh, for the, for this change. The system balancing, therefore. Um, is a very important point. We have a massive share of variable renewable energy sources with a locally high degree of yeah, simultaneous generation patterns, and they cause a lot of, um, yeah, uh, or let, let me say, high ramps at onshore connection points, um, um, as we have seen them already. And they cannot only have high ramps in positive way, but also in negative way if you have thunderstorms or storms and uh, mothballing of wind farms, uh, you know, coordinatedly, and therefore um, we need um, more advanced flexibility product, products in the balancing markets to satisfy operational flexibility, for example, and ancillary services. This not, goes not only, by the way, for real power, we need it also in reactive power, because we have seen also in our grid that we have huge uh, differences in, 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 in the, in the uh, reactive power procurement, and therefore we had dips in our voltage, which we have never, have never seen before due to windmills. Um, and therefore, uh, again, I come to the system security. Very high shares of variable renewable can 
depending on the system, have adverse effects on frequency stability, on voltage stability, uh, and also on line loadings and voltage profiles. This is already seen in small isolated systems and partly also seen, uh, we have seen it here by us in, in Germany, but um, it can be expected also in larger areas in the next decade as well if the evolution of the system is not carefully planned. And I'm a bit, you know, I heard what, what Claude said, and I really appreciated uh, what he said about uh, the role of the TSOs. Um, but I, I'm not sure that we can follow all um, uh, of, his, uh, of his suggestions, because we uh, always, also with more intelligence, we will not completely say uh, that the, the copper will not be uh, uh, expended, because that will not work without copper, uh, especially the connection from the offshore uh, wind farm. But on the other hand side, I fully uh, am aware that we need the environmental protection and also the public acceptance, because without that, we cannot gain it. The relevance of actions that will minimize the environmental footprint uh, for offshore grids and for the infrastructure and facilitate, uh, facilitates public acceptance is increasing as opposition to offshore and onshore wind generation and transmission systems, um, that they have to grow. So we have to, to win the people, I have to say. And the last point I want to med mention is <laughs> that we, uh, you know, I heard a lo lot of things about uh, hybrid grids and, and interconnected grids outside in, in, in the sea. But uh, if this is done in DC, we still have to develop the technologies, you know. Uh, end of the uh, century, uh, 19th century, we had a war between Westinghouse and Edison. And uh, Edison at least uh, lose this war because he uh, set his, uh, you know, his future on, on DC current and uh, Westinghouse on, on AC current. And we still need to develop um, a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of facilities uh, who can bring us to a meshed uh, offshore grid, especially, for example, if you think about a circuit breaker. We still have no circuit breakers in DC, uh, which allows us to, to cut down um, failures in our grid uh, in, in due time uh, without uh, any uh, damages. So these technology questions will be also a very important one. So sorry for bother you for a lot of challenges, but uh, I think that has to be said. Well, thank you so much, Joachim. I hope you solve your own little challenge in Germany and get back the internet connection. Yeah, that is about, about Vodafone, but I think uh, they have done it meantime. But unfortunately, I could not uh, dial in now by computer, unfortunately. <laughs> thank you but so I'm much. I'm still sitting in my office where you have seen, by the way, the digitalization, uh, my Mimic board on the, on the left side is the old one, which was in 1990 when I started here my career. Uh, and um, yeah, it is now meantime, of course, done by uh, huge computers and computer screens. So we are heading a, uh, forward in uh, the TSO business for uh, digitalization, definitely. Thank you once again. I'm Europe is a huge market. Buy on gigawatts, get the third fresh one. Fresh electrons, get fresh, fresh electrons, electrons here. Get your fresh electrons here. In which electrical energy is a very much sought after commodity. It's mine, I saw it first. You pushed in front. There are still a few more. Should I give them to you anyway? The power lines all have their own capacity. As such, the volume of electricity traded between countries is not unlimited. Especially since energy is not stored on a large scale. Exchange rules therefore need to be set to limit congestion risks. This is what happens when you do your shopping at the same time as everyone else. Go, go, it's green! If a thousand cars travel at 80 kilometers per hour, but we hold back 150... The calculation methods suggested by the TSOs and adopted by the regulators mean that the highest flow rate possible can be defined for these exchanges. And this happens two days in advance, one day in advance, or even several times a day. With these data, TSOs can operate their lines at maximum capacity while maintaining grid security. For a fairer price and less CO2. Done. Dear friends, I'm glad to say that our next speaker will join me here in Flesh, being completely off offline at least for a while, well online for you, dear audience. Uh, I'm glad to give the floor to the CEO of Ellering, Mr. Davi Veskimagi. His keynote will focus on meshed grid, offshore wind initiative and innovative solutions. <coughs> Dear colleagues, uh, 
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to welcome you all uh, in our conference and uh, say hello from Tallinn. Of course, I would like to see you here in Tallinn and uh, welcome all you physically, but unfortunately our current circumstances not allows to, to meet you physically, but as uh, Joachim already said uh, earlier in his uh, presentation that, uh, that I'm also hope that uh, we as a big family of uh, DSOs and regional security coordinators that we are definitely have a chance to come together pretty soon because I'm very much uh, missing those nice uh, events uh, physically together with, with you because this kind of live debate uh, also behind uh, behind the scenes um, uh, um, uh, behind the dinner tables uh, always very very appreciated and and really keep us together and and help us uh, to make our job uh, very much a coordinated uh, way which uh, quite often based on uh, informal personal uh, relations as my presentation titled Mesh Grid and Offshore Wind Initiative and Innovative uh, Solutions, um, uh, then I, I'd like to really start the question why that um, I'm already years uh, very much based on my own appro approach. Um, Simon Sinek, a famous uh, book, always start with why and it's pretty much relevant to ask that why we transmission system operators together with uh, regional security coordinators that uh, why we deal so extensively uh, uh, integrating renewables uh, into into the grid and and the answer for me is not so much uh, driven by uh, climate goals and uh, green uh, deal and national uh, targets but but really our own main duty, uh, security of supply, and your security of supply of our, our customers. Uh, because um, if um, we see that, that, that our mission keep lights on, then of course we have to be ready that uh, in the future we have almost all or, or at least a very large part of uh, uh, generators uh, based on uh, inverters and it, it means that we should uh, be be ready for for that and we have to keep lights on also in that that circumstances that that this is uh, why at least here in Ellering uh, very much um, a drive um, uh, the integration of uh, renewables in, into greed uh, and 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 we, we believe that uh, that the transmission system operators uh, beside our main duty also have a very challenging task to fulfill uh, to also help uh, European Commission national governments uh, to achieve 2050 2030 uh, climate climate goals that basically put these two parts together ensure security of supply and same time help to uh, achieve uh, climate goals. Why I really uh, say that we also stated in our strategy that uh, exactly uh, that way that our vision to ensure security of supply in the climate neutral way using extensively digital tools for safe market uh, uh, based energy system operation. And I think all words are uh, somehow important that uh, that I already touched the questions uh, concerning the security of supply and climate neutrality, but uh, uh, digital tools and, uh, and we here in Estonia are very proud that we use uh, a lot of digital tools for, for public service and I, I think we approach the uh, same way to the energy system operation that that we, we really believe that uh, that if there are security of supply and if there are uh, uh, climate change and um, a lot of uh, intermittent generation uh, future in, in the grid that that uh, uh, digital tools uh, are those enablers uh, to help us to operate also future grid uh, very uh, safe uh, safe way and i don't know is is this coincidence or or not uh, I hope 
not that uh, when we started something uh, decade ago, uh, the process uh, uh, somehow footsteps of uh, electricity market liberalization also bring Estonian gas market uh, out from um, administrative regulated prices and, uh, and uh, out uh, uh, of uh, Gazprom controlled uh, uh, supplies and and we really succeeded to uh, to uh, bought uh, uh, our gas transmission grid also uh, from from Gazprom and really fully functionally integrate uh, those electricity and gas transmission system operators together that we basically have a same control room uh, and we have a same market department uh, and of course all um, support functions, um, uh, uh, they're integrated, that uh, this kind of uh, one energy system based approach is very natural in, in, in our, uh, our office. And I think also uh, today's uh, challenges or uh, in front of today's challenges, this kind of integrated electricity gas uh, system operations uh, maybe allows us to be more efficient and, and really use this kind of links uh, between um, uh, different um, energy carriers and, and uh, operating um, uh, those, those grids. As a, just a one uh, e example. And now we moving a bit closer to the Baltic Sea offshore grid. Uh, exactly that. Uh, security of supply, first step, this is our main task. Uh, help governments uh, to um, uh, deliver their promises and uh, decarbonize entire energy sector, use digital tools for, for that. But the main question uh, uh, stays that where this energy comes from. And we really believe that uh, in the future, most of uh, our energy come, comes from uh, offshore, offshore wind. Uh, and this is exactly why, and all, once again, why, why we uh, uh, kicked off uh, uh, Baltic Sea Offshore Creed Initiative. Really help to mitigate uh, this uh, transition and get uh, faster, cheaper uh, uh, Baltic Sea Offshore Creed, uh, offshore wind into, into the grid. And this is a very such large uh, layout how this Baltic Sea offshore grid uh, might look like, but, but this is really the skeleton. But uh, now, I, I think together with our Baltic Sea uh, good uh, DSO colleagues uh, and uh, uh, lead it by regional uh, group uh, uh, Baltic Sea, we already draft a memorandum of understanding uh, uh, between all regional uh, DSOs to start to develop uh, Baltic Sea offshore uh, uh, grid all together. Because I don't, and, and of course we all uh, aware uh, last week published European Commission uh, offshore wind strategy and um, there are many players, but I believe that uh, we, I believe that uh, offshore grid should be treated as way as an onshore uh, grid. I don't see that, that there are no point to differentiate uh, grids uh, based on domain where uh, those grids uh, are. It doesn't matter are those grids uh, on sea or uh, 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 are uh, those grids on, on, on shore. It, it doesn't matter. I think we should look those as a one integral uh, uh, part of our entire energy system. And if, of course, if uh, most of our large production capacities uh, uh, behind the offshore grid, then definitely to keep our promise, keep lights on, we should uh, also manage uh, the offshore uh, part of our, our grid. This is why it's so important uh, to take a lead together, uh, transmission system operators and uh, regional security coordinators in the future, regional capacity coordinators, uh, and uh, not uh, uh, allows to really uh, distinguish uh, different parts of our integrated grid. Uh, vice versa, even look grid more um, uh, 
uh, integrated uh, over uh, the border, look market more integrated over the national uh, border. Um, and uh, what is the enablers? As I, I mentioned already, that, 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 that those digital tools are, are those enablers for us. And, and we have uh, pretty many um, digital initiatives in our office in Ellering and uh, many, very many in cooperation with uh, uh, you uh, guys um, behind the, the screens, uh, that all those uh, uh, initiatives uh, almost is uh, somehow cross-border and, and uh, as you uh, read those initiatives uh, uh, you can find that, uh, that at least a uh, couple of uh, uh, those initiatives you are part on. Uh, but I'd like to really uh, highlight the one, what I did already last year in Copenhagen, uh, time of the um, uh, same conference that, that, that we all here in the Baltics look also the Baltic regional security cooperator as a digital platform, as an enabler. Uh, not so much as a separate entity, but exactly as a platform for data sharing that, that the really decisions uh, uh, still based on the local know-how, but the data sharing there, uh, uh, which allows to uh, act bold and very cooperated uh, uh, manner. And this is, I'm, I, I should say that I'm a bit um, sad that uh, if I, uh, if I uh, should uh, uh, implement the, the current um, EU legislation and, uh, and really move from such uh, flexible digital platform as Baltic uh, RSCI to uh, really central entity as uh, Baltic regional capacity coordinator, definitely there is a challenge how to keep all those uh, uh, good features, good features uh, to uh, 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 stay as flexible and uh, result oriented as we have uh, been uh, so so far. And this is almost all from my side uh, and I'm open uh, for questions uh, now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Davi. Um, there are a few questions actually. Um, first question, uh, what would you say to those people who, um, who have an idea that, well, renewables uh, are fine, uh, and they're like a good addition to our already existing infrastructure. But uh, when the going gets tough, well, still the power stations and lines in our backyards will be the ones to save the day. First, of course, uh, energy policy is never the value free. And uh, if uh, value for us is really uh, to mitigate the climate change and decarbonize the entire energy sector, the, and entire economy that, that we should should accept uh, those changes uh, uh, what we uh, are going to, to see next uh, decade or, or so that uh, I think this is some kind of a balancing act between interest of different stakeholders the, and I think uh, we as a transmission system operator we as a regional security coordinators we have to be uh, in central place uh, to really uh, mitigate uh, uh, this uh, balancing act between the society, owners, uh, our customers, and also our own employees. All right. Uh, when we talk about offshore and then wind energy, we can't escape the question of storage. Now, what would you say is the most appropriate storage, uh, the te most appropriate technological solution for the Baltics? Uh, I don't know, frankly speaking, and uh, no one knows it uh, finally. But what I really believe that I'm such a keen believer that uh, technology neutrality is a crucial part of our um, energy market. And uh, I really hope that we can uh, leave uh, competition uh, uh, exists and we really uh, allow the best technologies, wind, race, 
but what we do and maybe what I already touched a bit that we are integrated electricity gas transmission system operator and of course uh, it somehow uh, placed us r r very well also in light of the uh, Baltic Sea offshore wind uh, to also look at what we can do uh, concerning the hydrogen storage that that that, that really Finally, consumers need the energy. It doesn't matter what is the energy carrier, really. And we believe that, okay, finally, very much energy in the future consumed as electricity. But, uh, but the way how to transport, especially large quantities, uh, energy, I think there might be really the such green hydrogen option. And what we are doing right now, that we, just as, as example, that we have a pretty nice infrastructure already in place between Estonia and Finland, for instance, that we have a, uh, DC cables, but we have a, a gas pipes that, that there may, might be arbitration between different interconnectors, that which interconnector really do this job most efficient way, but it allows that, uh, but it means that we should also integrate electricity and gas market much, much closer. Well, actually, I think the next question addresses exactly what you just mentioned, uh, the climate goals. Well, they're clearly going to change the uh, energy uh, sector and the security of supply significantly over the next uh, decade. Now, how do you see the integration of energy systems? Are the energy systems actually ready for that uh, ambition, uh, ambitious transition? Uh, I, I experience teaches us as, uh, um, as much uh, as, as something, something else, else couldn't, couldn't do. And uh, my experience uh, based on such last decade that if there are infrastructure in place, market always follow. That, uh, that um, I think market players are uh, smart enough uh, to really capture those opportunities, what we create based on the new pieces of infrastructure. That if uh, the good infrastructure and market setup in place, I really believe that the market players able to capture those opportunities and really uh, uh, make uh, or, or great this. Uh, uh, competition uh, uh, live between different uh, energy carriers. Right. Uh, do you actually see a role for the RSCs in the planning of the offshore meshed grid? Or would their role step in only after the grid has been developed? Um, as as, as uh, I already mentioned that uh, last week, uh, and as we, we all know that last week European Commission published uh, uh, offshore uh, wind strategy and uh, uh, there are also a couple of times uh, mentioned uh, future regional uh, capacity coordinators and, and their role. Um, most important for me that uh, transmission system operators and uh, regional um, capacity coordinators that we, we act together. Uh, and I'm a bit scared that uh, if there are too many players in place, that uh, there might be or we might end up also uh, a bit a mess. Uh, this is why, in, at least from my point of view, this is not a good idea uh, to create a separate uh, offshore transmission system operators for uh, uh, offshore, uh, offshore grid. Uh, uh, I um, instead really prefer uh, the way that uh, every transmission system operator manage their grid uh, offshore as a way as onshore and we have a lot of extensively uh, uh, high voltage uh, DC connections already in place and uh, we can manage those interconnectors uh, very smoothly why we couldn't also manage uh, based on the good cooperation between transmission system operators also uh, uh, generators uh, uh, on the uh, sea. Thank you so much. I'm afraid this so is much. all the time we have uh, for now. Thanks.
difference. Managing a power grid's flows is mainly a question of balance between generation and consumption. Mm. To maintain this delicate balance, the RSCs use a calculation mechanism to check whether energy generated in the short term at regional level is sufficient to meet demand and thereby avoid a shortage. Uh, it's going to go out! It's going to go out! If the power grid is short on energy, RSC engineers evaluate with TSOs what coordinated action can be taken to correct these imbalances. Yes, I understand you need it, but your neighbour needs it too. They submit these proposals to the TSOs, which need to assess their feasibility and adapt them to the real-time situation on their grid. These solutions involve, for example, making use of reserve generation. Oh, don't scare me like that! Or suggesting that certain customers reduce their consumption. Whoa, 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 what, we, we can't even have fun anymore? Yes! So, dear friends, time for our second panel, the role of regional coordination in meshed grid operators. I'm very glad to hand over the virtual floor to our moderator, who also joins us virtually. Gerald, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to moderate this panel. And moderating a panel means giving most room to panelists and giving most room to your questions. So the panel is about the role of coordination in mesh grid operations. And it's all what we are TSOs are striving for, the climate neutrality to achieve though this big obje objectives. And we have four panelists. It's Jens Möller-Birkbeck, manager of the Nordic RSC, Giles Dixon, CEO from Wind Europe, Britt Heindler, he is working on the offshore grid development, and Jens Helmsmans, Helms, Helms, Belgian North Sea Energy Corporation Presidency. And we will start first with a round of presentations from all of those four panelists. And I would like to call Jens, Jan Hensmans first for start. Thank you, Jan. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to be here. And it's uh, very timely also that you organized this this conference. This morning, um, we had the Energy Working Party. We had a, a presentation uh, of the Commission on their famous uh, European Offshore Renewable Strategy. But I suppose some other people already talked about this. Uh, but one of the things that's very important in there, well, there's there's a lot of things very important in there, is, is uh, actually regional cooperation. Uh, and they state themselves that regional cooperation is key for the development of offshore um, and that's also uh, why uh, I'm here representing the North Seas Energy Cooperation which is a cooperation between 10 countries around bordering the North Sea uh, together with the European Commission. We co-chair uh, a lot of working groups, we work together um, uh, also with TSOs and regulators represented, market parties, of course the industry, we have a lot, uh, but uh, my friend Charles will say something more about that uh, afterwards, I guess. Uh, we have uh, a lot of contacts with the industry also. Um, next year, uh, we uh, and somebody already mentioned it, we, we, uh, we will be discussing the bidding zones, uh, the offshore bidding zones, which is also uh, a part of the uh, of the propositions of the European Commission uh, and where we will work upon. Uh, together with the TSOs, of course, we have already heard a lot of good ideas from the TSOs and we will elaborate on that and, and see how we can not only uh, um, use that in the North Seas, but also in, in the other sea basins around Europe. Um, Another very important thing for us is, is joint projects uh, and also there in the Baltic you have already uh, uh, quite some experience on that. Um, that is something tangible, if I can say that, is that uh, a lot of countries work together like we are now working together with the UK on... Um, on an interconnection, on a hybrid connection, where we, you have the interconnection, but uh, it's also uh, directly linked to uh, wind parks. We have others in, in, in the Netherlands, in Denmark, 
uh, and in Germany also. And and there, the the it's very important that we don't only cooperate with with TSOs, but also the RSC has a has a major role, as has bringing this all together and having a joint view on all this. And I will stop here uh, with my introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, very much, Jan, for the introduction here from a policy op a perspective. And now I would like to pass on the word to Giles for the uh, perspective of wind development. Thank you very much indeed, Gerald. I hope you can hear me. Perfect. Can you hear me? Perfect. Everything's fine. Excellent. Marvellous. Delighted to be sharing some observations with you. The Commission's offshore renewable energy strategy that Jan Hensmans has just mentioned was a very good piece of work by the Commission. It enshrines the goal of 300 gigawatts of offshore wind in Europe by 2050. Today, the EU has only 12 gigawatts of offshore wind. So this is a 25 times increase in capacity. It's a huge increase. The industry can deliver that, provided that the EU and national governments get certain things right. And one of those certain things is the very large investments required in the expansion of grid capacity. This is the expansion of offshore grid capacity, of course, connecting all of these new offshore wind farms to the mainland. It's also the reinforcing of onshore grid capacity. It's one thing to bring all the electrons that the offshore wind farms will be generating to the coast. It's another thing to integrate them successfully into domestic transmission networks without there being bottlenecks. Already some countries in Europe, including your own, Jan, are seeing challenges here on your own TSO, Jan. Elio is having to make significant investments in the reinforcement of onshore grid capacity in Belgium to accommodate the new volumes that will be coming from the Princess Elizabeth zone of wind farms that you are now developing in Belgium. The other area in which grid investments are going to be required, of course, and we've been hearing all about this, is in the development of hybrid offshore wind farms and their grid connections. And by hybrid offshore wind farm, we mean any wind farm that has a connection to more than one country. There will be many different models of hybrid offshore wind farms. There'll be the Krieger's Flak model. Krieger's Flak is the one and only hybrid offshore wind farm currently being developed, or currently being built, I should say. It's in the Baltic. It has a connection to Germany and a connection to Denmark. And in due course, it may have a connection to Sweden as well. That's a simple model. It's one cluster of offshore wind farms with two and in due course, we hope three separate grid connections to two, three different countries. But other models might involve plugging the connections from offshore wind farms into interconnectors. I was very interested, Jan, by what you had to say about that in respect of Belgium and the UK. And I hope you'll share a little bit more detail on that with us shortly. Another model, which some TSOs are already actively developing, for example, Tenet, is developing artificial islands and platforms in the North Sea, for example, developing offshore wind farms around those artificial islands and platforms, having AC connections into what will essentially be a hub on these artificial islands platforms, and then DC connections from the hub to uh, the mainland. And that, of course, could be the mainland in uh, uh, two or uh, in, in more than one country. The Offshore Renewable Energy Strategy the Commission adopted last week was very good on the target for the expansion of offshore wind, and it was very good on many other things. It was perhaps a little disappointing on grid expansion, and we hope that is because the Commission are holding their fire for their proposal, which they'll be adopting on the 15th of 
December for the revision of the 10E regulation. And in that, they will set out the detail on how to support investments in offshore grids. The Commission strategy from last week uh, does um, uh, say that the Commission will uh, develop with member states a framework for the anticipatory investments in grids. Um, it doesn't make it very clear uh, how, if at all, this should link to ENSOE's work on planning, such as uh, TYNDP process. So there's still quite a lot of work to be done there. But it's quite clear that the Commission recognises the need for a huge scale up in grid investments to integrate uh, these huge volumes of offshore wind into the energy system. And of course, part of this as well will be some investment uh, in uh, renewable hydrogen, in electrolysis, uh, and that may, of course, involve some uh, refitting of existing natural gas pipelines uh, to carry renewable hydrogen. I will close there for the time being. Thank you. Giles, thank you very much. And now, from the offshore wind perspective, we go to the people to actually do the offshore grid extension. Britt, please, your time, your view to state your point. Yeah, thank you, Gerald, and thank for the other panelists for participating here and all the other participants via the digital channels. Uh, my name is Britt Heinle. I'm here as the uh, offshore development manager uh, in Ering and uh, supporting the future of uh, the energy system in, the, in Estonia. And uh, already Giles mentioned here one of the key documents that was just published last week from the uh, EU, the strategy for the offshore renewable energy. But it's not the only document that actually has been in the forefront for offshore, offshore production. Definitely the climate, the climate uh, targets for uh, nations, the climate targets for the whole EU community, the Green Deal, uh, also the Baltic Sea Offshore Wind Joint Declaration, the North Sea Cooperation. There are several, several uh, leading, um, uh, leading organizations that already uh, emphasize the need for offshore energy and have thought how to in uh, incorporate that into the energy mix in, in Europe. But maybe if we looked, uh, look even beyond that or look uh, what are the targets for the TSOs that are coming from with the enormous ambitions that the uh, EU has with a 25 fold increase in offshore wind production is that what does that mean in essence for the grid? Um, it has a massive effect. Um, we have areas uh, all over Europe where the production capacity either uh, is way larger where the, the, uh, compared to the uh, consumption capacity or vice versa. If we take, for example, Estonia, where we are situated physically here at the moment with the conference, then uh, our potential is about three and a half times higher of production offshore than the actual maximum consumption of the country. So that's why it's not... It's, it's a big change in, in the essence of the grid if we go offshore. And definitely we would go offshore if we want to be energy neutral, um, if we want to be carbon neutral 2050. So, but what are then the, um, what are then the uh, actual um, tools that are needed for that, actual needs from the TSO side that we could start uh, the uh, planning of this kind of a grid? We need relevant planning principles, for example. There is no meshed grids at the moment. There is only point-to-point -point interconnectors and uh, the first idea of a hybrid connection has been realized with the Krieger's Flag project, but that also is not connected into three, uh, more, it's not connected more than two um, uh, zones. Uh, we need the understanding of the high-level system operation principles. Uh, at the moment, the, the grid uh, there is, as there is no mesh grid, there is also no pilots that would be uh, the way, showing the way forward how we would operate such a system. 
Um, also, there should be a unilateral and commonly agreed wind production connection and coordination system in Europe. Uh, the regulatory framework also is very important uh, if we look uh, at uh, all the uh, seas that are all the countries that are bordering the sea where this offshore grid would be connected to. It's very important to have an uh, underlying understanding of the framework that exists. It's uh, because otherwise you create a situation for, for example, where you have different countries that start to uh, f uh, fight among one another where the production will be. And of course, we need flagship projects. We need to start somewhere. We need to have um, uh, uh, milestones. We need to have uh, uh, leaders that show how this can be made. From the technology point of view, this envisioned uh, HVDC offshore hybrid system is hindered because of the high cost of converter technology, uh, lack of experience with protection systems. Uh, there is four clearance components that need to have a, a better understanding and, uh, and, uh, and so on and so on. But at the same time, these are technical components and they should come along when there is need from the sector where the grid actually is being started to be developed. So I would like to conclude my introduction with saying that there is a big task ahead and a lot of obstacles to uh, be met. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the TSO cooperation definitely is one of the key roles here. We see that only when the TSOs cooperate and uh, have a common vision with this offshore grid, then it's possible to uh, have the targets set uh, by the community in Europe. Uh, um, th it's only then possible to reach them. Yep, thank you. Fritz, thank you very much. I envy you that you're actually live at the location while I am here standing in my office. Now, this is an RSC conference, and now let's go to Jens, who is a manager at the Nordic RSC, for your view, perfectly fitting to this conference. Yes, thank you very much, Gerald. And as you mentioned, um, in the Nordic RSC, um, we see that from this perspective, we are now the Nordic RSE in, in year four of our journey uh, to build the Nordic RSE activity. And um, looking into the future green energy transition, let me just uh, say that I share my co panelists' view to, to the challenges, but allow me to, to add the operational dimension and, and the changes needed to operate the future common offshore and onshore uh, power system efficiently and, and still ensure that uh, we have a high level of, of security of supply. Uh, when we move from, from today's about 12 maybe gigawatt uh, offshore wind generation to 60 gigawatt uh, in 2030 and maybe massive 400 gigawatt in, in uh, 2050, combined with large storage units and uh, huge power to X consumers, the challenges to operations are not trivial. It's neither trivial from an operational planning perspective nor from a real-time operations perspective. And the investment in generation and grid development are enormous. Uh, they are necessary and they get a lot of focus and attention. Despite that there is a significant focus also on the digitalization, as has been illustrated well today, the focus and investment in this area should be prioritized much more across the industry because it is a huge task and it can hardly be overestimated. It goes without saying that the operational planning of larger offshore power systems, they must be coordinated between several TSOs, they must be optimized regionally and uh, perhaps even cross-regionally. However, this is exactly the mission of the RSCs and the offshore power system can be integrated in the present services in the RSCs under the legal umbrella of the clean energy package. So uh, let's try our best to avoid additional complexity and continue to view the entire power system as it is one system. As uh, Tavo Veskimaki 
uh, rightly uh, announced that, that from an operational perspective, it is not important whether the grid is subsea and the power system offshore or it is onshore. So the operational planning and optimization of the power system from long term year ahead to intraday must be seen and coordinated as one system to ensure an efficient utilization of the grid and the power system at large. The RSEs and the services that the RSEs are providing to the TSOs, they can be developed to support the new offshore power system. The RSEs will provide the regional coordination whilst the TSOs and the DSOs, they will make the local decisions in line with the uh, agreed security level and in overall to the benefit of the society. So, so let me just take the two points. Please go for more focus and priority on the digital, digitalization of our industry fast. And then let's all agree on and strive to minimize the complexity in governance and operations of the future power system. That's my plea and my entry to this discussion. So a big thank you to the, our four panelists. This was the first round of more general statements. And now we want to come to the second round, this time only um, for Jens and Britt and, uh, to make statements on how it sees roles in the future of the U European energy system and large-scale renewable operation can be. And in the preparation, we said it is okay when it is a little bit more controversial because then it is more fun in the debate. So, and we said that again, Jens will start here this second round and may I pass the word back to Jens here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, in line with the uh, with the overall, uh, say, uh, statement of the uh, or, or theme for the for the uh, this year's RSC conference, I, I would like to say address the area of, of, of data again, because uh, this is basically where where I see that uh, we have big challenges and also an area where the RSCs really can contribute to, uh, of course, the coordination, but also the efficient operation of the grid. So, so the RCs, as we have heard also today, they are regional service providers. And uh, until now, it's particular for the TSOs. And that's through the development and implementation of, of closely integrated uh, business processes for the, for the regional operational planning. The future green power system will be a combination of thousands of smaller fluctuating generation and, and, and storage units and large centralized wind and solar parks, massive and, and very large size offshore installations and probably a number of very large uh, power to X consumers. However, it's all connected to the same grid and it's operating in balance at the same frequency across the synchronous area. But let's realize that the, this future system cannot be operated efficiently with the same tools and processes we are using today or which we have been using, uh, say, in the past. And, and that's my point. The game changer in this regional TSO, TSO and TSO RSC business development is the future availability of standardized and reliable, updated and online data for the entire power system. And I don't think we have realized yet how large this game changer really is. Now, let me highlight three areas which is highly depending on general availability of data. The security of supply and efficiency of operation that's sort of where we have the focus uh, when we are in the development today. The RSCs are fully data-based coordination centers. We cannot do anything unless we have the data available and unless we are integrated into our stakeholders' activities. But the RSCs, they transform this abundance of data to useful information. 
And this allows the TSO to operate the power system safely and efficiently despite the embedded um, uncertainties in the renewable energy generation. So, so consistent data of high quality for the entire regional power system is of prime importance for the RCs. And it's a basis for the, for the complex calculations of, of the regional capacities from long term to intraday and close to real time and for the security analysis of the power system in the same time frame. But it also provides the basis for other important calculations like regional optimization of, of procurement of, of balancing power, of optimal activation of balancing power across the region, and uh, the illustration of requirements perhaps for storage and demand side response. And then the other point uh, is that it creates trust and confidence. If you have consistent data, then it not only provides the basis for the secure and optimal operation of the regional power system, but it also provides the transparency uh, on the decision-making processes, which is for the benefit of the communication with all the power system stakeholders. And then it creates the basis for innovation. It's also, during this conference, been mentioned by several participants that the openness of data will greatly support the innovation in our industry. And we are relying on this to be able to deliver on the Green Deal. So it's the role of the TRCs to provide the best information to the TSOs and other stakeholders based on available data. But it's the role of all parties and stakeholders involved in the use of the power system to provide these data of high quality. And there are the conflicting interest, maybe. Um, there are ownership of data, there are other aspects, but the requirement of having data available will in the future be, the, be equally important to any other requirements for grid users. This must not be underestimated when discussing the transition to this fully carbon neutral energy system. So let's keep the grid and the uh, data and the exchange of data as key focus areas when we are innovating uh, the way to operate the new power system. Thank you. Jens, thank you very much. You made a very clear point on data and the challenges around it. And if I could now ask Brit to give us your view from our uh, grid perspective. Yeah, thanks uh, Jens, thanks uh, Gerald. And I would not even argue about the importance of an RSC in an operational grid. Definitely in the future when we have a grid uh, that is way more complex than we have one now, then the RSCs will have a very unique position where they actually might give more guidance towards the TSOs, more, uh, make more uh, short-term adequacy analysis uh, we'll be doing more uh, offshore transmission capacity estimations. They will have to develop new tools. They would have to look at the uh, not only the point-to-point the point, the point point HVDC connections, but the mesh grid uh, multi-terminal solutions uh, for these calculations. Look at the uh, possible offshore bidding zone and how these will affect the uh, RSC's uh, uh, task that has been given to them. But maybe I would look from the TSO perspective is, is, the, is, is the today. At the moment, there is no such a grid. And, uh, and, uh, and my question maybe from the TSO side, is there a place for an RSC during this planning of the grid? And maybe I would argue that no. Um, if we look at the cooperation that is uh, being made uh, around uh, Europe for the grid developments, we have different uh, multilateral cooperations that are being made between countries. We have uh, joint intents uh, that are being signed by countries where to develop these wind production areas. We have a uh, common understanding between the TSOs to develop the future grid, or we are at the moment trying to also rationalize that into an agreement. 
with the Baltic uh, to the, to the, together, uh, then um, uh, cooperate under the Baltic Offshore Grid Initiative. So I would argue that the RCC role at the moment is being in the role that it is. It is for the operational purposes. It is uh, to ensure the uh, adequacy, the security. And uh, maybe it will act as a player in these future grids only when they have been built. Thank you very much to the panelists for their initial statements. Now we have about half an hour room for questions and debate. And this is the first conference where I actually heard, saw questions that came in before the panel started. And I would like uh, to start with some of the questions. And um, uh, I would like to start with the role of uh, the RSCs because there are several questions. I grouped them. And um, the first question is, which is large is the larger challenge for RSCs getting needed in from TSOs or from market participants? I guess, Jens, that is for you. Um, yes, I think the very first uh, quick answer is that, that we get our data uh, through the TSOs at the moment. So, so we, have no, we have no, say, direct feed-in from, uh, from market participants. Um, and, and that's a very short answer. Uh, this may change in the future, but but uh, our business processes are tightly linked uh, with the TSO business processes and uh, the sharing of and development of the uh, individual grid models and the common grid models are based on information that are shared by the TSOs. So the market players, they are delivering their data into the TSOs and um, then we get that through the TSO. Having said that, I'm absolutely sure that the development and sharing of data from the market players uh, into the TSO community, that will be a crucial point in the future. Um, and that main, main problem there would probably be that we need to um, operate closer to real time. Today, a, a major focus on markets and uh, activities planning is related to the day ahead processes. And then we have intraday uh, possibilities to trade, uh, but it's not uh, in a very, say, uh, huge extent. My personal view is that uh, with the fluctuations that we have, will be seeing, we'll be looking into in the future with the, with a new renewable system, we will be forced to work and operate and plan and calculate and share data much closer to real time. Because we all know that uh, fluctuating generation, um, the forecasting is important and uh, the uncertainty of forecasting is huge two days ahead, whilst one hour ahead, it's much more secure. And that will allow us to optimize the efficiency and the utilization of the grid to a complete different dimension that we uh, can do today, because we need to take uh, significant uh, security limits into play there. Thank you. And now a word to the audience. You can use Slido to ask questions and you could, can also rate those questions. So if you click on like, they go up and then they will be on the top of the list. So if I don't bring up your questions because of time and because it's not up of the list, so please look at the questions and rate them so they come up. But first, before we look at further questions, I would like to ask the panelists if they want to comment on the data issue or on any other issues raised in the first 45 minutes that we shared together. Any, uh, any views here?
I would say... Uh, Gerald, yes, I would like to say something too. I would maybe start. start. Yeah, uh, I would maybe start that uh, definitely from Ethering side, we have been very pro openness uh, regarding the uh, data, and uh, we would uh, we have been in the forefront of uh, data sharing, of course through secure channel channels, in order to have the grid operate in a more uh, optimized way. So from a TSO perspective, at least from our side, we do see that this data should be made more available more quickly and in a more uh, transparent way to the RSCs. Thank you. Now, Giants, you wanted to comment on this as well. Thank you, Joel. On two issues. First, HVDC and interoperability. Somebody touched on this issue earlier. As people know, there are three manufacturers of HVDC technology and platforms for connecting offshore wind farms to the grid. That is Siemens Energy, GE, and Hitachi ABB and their respective technologies today are not fully interoperable. Now that's okay so long as we're only building point-to-point -point grid connections from offshore wind farms to the mainland. But once we start developing hybrid projects, then it's very likely that uh, the three different manufacturers' respective technologies and platforms will need to be interoperable because they will be operating probably alongside one another. Now, the good news here is that the European Commission recognizes that it, this is an issue and they are ready to invest significant funds from Horizon Europe, the EU's R&D program, uh, to develop a large-scale demonstration project that will show that there is a solution to this problem and it works. And that, of course, would be linked to, uh, or ideally would be linked to, a uh, an early real life hybrid offshore wind farm. And the Commission are working very closely with ENSOE, with T&D Europe, and with Wind Europe on the development of this project. So that's, that's good. Secondly, uh, uh, Jan, I really would like you to share with us, please, more detail about the uh, interconnect uh, between Belgium and the UK. Uh, and how offshore wind farms might link into it. Um, and if you're going to have the floor next whilst you're thinking of your answer, if I could just make a general observation about the UK. The EU's offshore renewable energy strategy and the 300 gigawatt target is for EU27 only. But of course, we all know that the UK is by some distance number one in Europe, in fact, number one in the world in the development of offshore wind. They already have over 10 gigawatts and they have huge ambitions for more offshore wind. They want 40 gigawatts by 2030. That would be out of a European total of 110 gigawatts by 2030. Now, it makes sense from a market point of view, from the point of view of saving space and saving money, pooling of generation and transmission assets, that the UK should be taking part in hybrid offshore wind farms as well. Clearly, there are issues here. Um, if EU27 are going to develop their own uh, framework, enabling framework, rules, regulations for hybrid offshore wind farms, the UK would probably need to be replicating that in its own uh, legal arrangements. But clearly, it's in everybody's interest that there should be maximum possible collaboration with the UK uh, on the development of offshore wind and especially on the development of hybrid projects. And uh, in that context, very interested to, to hear, Jan, what more you have to say. Can I directly answer? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll keep ahead, it very please. short. <laughs> so, because it's it's it is in, in, indeed, as child says, if we are going to develop uh, our, our offshore, we do need UK. Now, the you know all the the problems around Brexit, also 
UK is part of, of the North Sea's energy cooperation, but uh, has chosen uh, not no longer to, to come to the meetings of the North Sea's energy cooperation as long as Brexit is not solved. So that's, that's very important to note. So one thing we have noted for our new presidency um, next starting next year, and we have already had, well, my minister, my new minister already had contact with the, with the UK ambassador in Belgium about that. Uh, as soon as we know the outcome of the Brexit, we will start uh, renegotiating with the UK to have the UK on board in the North Sea's energy cooperation. Uh, now, the the, um, the project that uh, that Charles is asking about, and which we call the Nautilus project, is the the second interconnector between Belgium and the UK. Uh, the idea, and actually, it's it's uh, our two TSOs, Elia and and National Grid, who are discussing on this of course, uh, alongside with us, um, is that we don't only build an, a new interconnector between our two countries, but that we, we see where we can connect this interconnector to an offshore wind park still to be developed by the UK. So uh, that's to give you an idea. And Charles, if you want more details, we can we can really discuss this uh, later, but that's the the um, the way it is now, and it's mostly it's a it's a, a TSO uh, initiative actually. Yeah, and that is really helpful. Uh, many thanks indeed for that, both on the uh, project linked to the Nautilus interconnector, and also on your plans for reintegrating, if possible, the UK in the North Sea's energy cooperation when Belgium assumes the presidency next year. If I could just make one small clarification, please. You, you did say, Jan, the UK has chosen not to take part. I think it's quite widely known the UK did not, in fact, have much choice in the matter, that it was the European Commission that, that chose that the UK should not take part. Yes, thank you. Exactly. And then the but UK, and that, then the UK said, in. yeah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy that we even have an intense debate over uh, over uh, many thousands of kilometers of distance. Anyhow, uh, let's get back to some of our questions from the audience. And they actually started rating the question. So I have a number one contender. And the question is. In getting all relevant info in real time for building CGMs vital for efficiency capacity calculation. And the question is, need for stronger RSCs? Question mark. And the second question that goes in a similar direction, <clears throat> is the current regional setup enough to deliver on the Green Deal? Should a new structure be created to have more coordination among energy policies in Europe? So the question is, should we have stronger RSCs? or should we have stronger coordination in all regards? I think this is a political question, this is a technical question, so all of you are happy to jump in. Who wants to go first? I, I can go first if you like, if, if you don't mind. So um, I'd say yes to both. Uh, I uh, stronger role for RSCs. We we definitely uh, are are in favor of that, um, uh, as because it's also the regional aspect. Also, uh, again, if you look at the offshore renewable energy strategy, it, it is quite uh, quite clear that that the region is key to to getting it further. Um, do we need uh, new platforms, regional platforms? Well, yes, we do need them where they don't exist and yet. But in the Baltics, they exist. Uh, they exist in the North Seas. Um, Mediterranean is lit. If, if, we if you look at, at uh, basically at the seas, you have five basins around around uh, Europe, and then you have the Baltics and the, the North Seas uh, that are uh, much developed, and the other zones are, are very under, underdeveloped. But uh, since we are led by politicians, by ministers, we have always, also, also always said we don't only do this for our region, but also to, to, to help the other regions, and in the end, to, to, to have a, a whole Europe, because the target we are aiming for by 2050 is a European target. Yeah, maybe I can Thank also you. comment on that. Um, I do feel that stronger R uh, RSCs are needed, but maybe it's not the, that 
uh, there should be a completely new system. But as Jan also told, then maybe the adaptation of the existing systems into all these regions would be would be necessary. Uh, definitely at the moment there is involvement with all these uh, political declarations with the strategies where also these all regions will see that these cooperation forms are needed. Uh, so maybe, maybe this question um, of making a completely new structure is a little bit too early. We will see uh, in, in quite small amount of time, I would say, uh, that if a new structure completely is needed, but I would, I would suggest that maybe not. Clear statement. Thank you. Anyone else on this question? Yes, please, Joel. Yeah. We need maximum possible coordination in both the planning and the operation of the grid. Yes. And the TYNDP is a key tool for delivering the necessary coordination, at least on the planning. On the operation, uh, we need a coordinated approach to ensure that the maximum possible volumes of what's being generated by offshore wind farms actually gets to the consumers and that we have the lowest possible operational costs. Uh, we have the lowest possible volumes of uh, curtailment. We have effective management of uh, congestion. Thank you, Jens. Is there something for you in that regard? Um, yeah, I may actually follow up exactly on what Giles is saying, because this is what we are striving for in the RSCs. Um, so, so I think the, uh, the sort of request that, uh, that Giles was uh, sending in our way uh, is uh, exactly what we would like to, to grab and, and to work with, uh, because it is obvious that uh, there is a strong need for maximum uh, efficiency and utilization uh, of our grid, and that will, that uh, say, uh, need will stay uh, until I cannot see any future where it will not stay. So, uh, therefore, this coordination that uh, is the role of the RSCs today, that uh, will in the future also be a key role to, to um, ensure the, the best efficiency and utilization and, of course, the provision of, of the maximum capacity of the marketplace. Um, so having said that, uh, the coordination between the regional um, and the, 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 the local, the coordination and decision making is crucial. So my key point is basically that we need to have the best possible cooperation across the stakeholders or the involved parties in, in this game to ensure that we, we optimize it as much as possible. And then, and now I draw my hobby horse again, sorry, as long as we have data available, as long as we have a transparency on data, then we can all judge and calculate on that basis. So there is not a need to say, um, dispute this, but there is a need to ensure that the, uh, let's say, the agreements, the political uh, support, uh, the decisions, the uh, market design and uh, structures, that these are developed in the best and most optimal way. This will support the operation significantly. Thank you very much for your statements. And now I would like to go back to the questions from the audience. And now we go for something completely different. And now this is the highest rated question. Should market participants invest and explore energy storage options? And is there any role for TSO's RSCs in energy storage? So, should TSOs or RSCs go into energy storage or should market participants do it? Any views on that? Maybe I can go first. Um, here, that's actually, it's a very interesting question because a uh, couple of 
weeks ago, there was a panel in the Estonian Academic of, uh, Academy of Sciences. And in that panel, there was a discussion on what would be the three keys of the future energy system. And the three keys of the future energy system were storage, storage and storage. So storage definitely is um, a very important role of, uh, of the system that is going to be enabling us to be in the energy, uh, this climate neutral system. Uh, regarding if the TSOs would be a part of that, if TSOs would have uh, the storage, mm, I do believe that it would be not the TSOs interest to be uh, in this uh, field of business, but they would actually uh, uh, be more happy if it would be coming from the market, that uh, the market would set up the needed uh, um, uh, regulations in order to purchase these services, these uh, uh, storage services from the market. Thank you. Any others? Just a small remark from my side, maybe I can 100% uh, guarantee that the RSCs are not interested in owning any storage. Uh, but what we could do is to say, uh, recommend areas where storage would be very relevant. But uh, that would be the RSC's input to that discussion, I think. Yes, that is, that is a clear statement to enhance your coordination role, but not have any assets of yourself. Then I would like to go again for um, two questions that uh, are very, very special. Um, the first question is, what measures can be taken in order to keep the neutrality and independence of energy economics research institutions like universities from private interests? Very interesting questions. Are those institutes really neutral or is there mixed in interests? And then there's another question that sort of relates to it. And I will also read this and maybe you can say your view. How much of the data will be made available to those outside the TSO community and will be open licensed for public policy analysis for example. So two questions, how neutral, how ensure neutrality of all the different institutes and will data be made available for them? Any views on that? Difficult questions, but they have, but they have the highest rating, so I had to bring them up. Yeah, maybe I can start. Maybe uh, regarding the institutions, um, it's very hard uh, actually maybe to understand the question in a way that uh, if there is a university or if there is some kind of a study institution that is highly connected to one of the participants that is on the market, for example, one of the producers of generators or windmills or whatever, uh, then, then they, what would be the harm in that? And, uh, and also their knowledge then would grow significantly through these cooperations. So maybe, 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 maybe the other panelists also can comment, maybe I don't understand the question properly. But then about the data that would be available uh, for the, uh, for the, uh, for the uh, public, uh, I think that that was covered also in one of the previous panels where you can also, when Kaia was, uh, uh, was uh, introducing the SV platform and how, how also we as a community should actually have uh, the possibility to share some data that would be available to the possible bright minds that are out there. And uh, that could put uh, into the system some flexibility and that could ensure us that the future system would have uh, both the uh, bottom up and uh, um, uh, top-down views, meaning that we have also some initiatives coming from, I don't know, the uh, private consumers that uh, form energy unions or, or, or whatever might be the, uh, the way how a future system works. Thank you. Anyone else on those questions? Go ahead, Jan. Yeah. 
if, if I if I may, yeah. Well, um, I, I in the beginning I, I I found it a very strange question, but thanks for your answer. So I think I I can I can place it now. Um, uh, we we have a, a habit that our universities uh, work together uh, with with industries, but are not dependent of them. Um, but but uh, you need some certain knowledge. Uh, on the one side, theoretic knowledge from university, and on the other side, from the industry, and you have to make a mix of that, uh, and that's only the only best way uh, that you can you, you can get the, to some results. Um, so, um, but that doesn't mean that that you are no longer independent. Um, as long as you are not a part of a company, uh, I think that's that's okay. Okay, then thank you very much. And then we have five minutes left and I would like to make a give the opportunity for a closing round for the panelists. And here I also want to use a question as a basis from the audience. And the question is, what in your opinion will be the greatest challenge for Europe in reaching the EU Green Deal objectives? A wonderful open question. So you can say anything on that question. But please, everyone, with one final last statement, and I make the order the opposite of your uh, starting uh, panel. So half a minute, half a minute to a minute each, and please, Jens, what are your final words? Okay, I think I would actually uh, like to say follow up on the on the last question. Um, and uh, I realize that there is a lot of uh, need for confidentiality of our data. And there is also a lot of uh, ownership uh, issues and liability issues that must be addressed. But allow me to take a personal position in that. Uh, and that is that um, this is not a zero sum uh, game, I think. There is a huge value which we none of us really can uh, say envision um, to allow the data free, basically, to the greatest extent possible. And this will allow the entire innovation uh, system that would allow uh, research institutes, that would allow market players really to benefit from uh, supporting each other and uh, create the Green Deal in the most efficient and market-based way. So, so there should be a continuous discussion on how much data can be given free. That would be my suggestion for a future discussion. Thank you. Clear statement. Prit, your last words today. My last words, I can actually take them together in two words and the biggest obstacle would be public acceptance. If we look at the grid, if we are doing this kind of huge and uh, great changes into the grid and uh, going into uh, the field that is a little bit unknown at the moment, when we physically start to build it, when we physically start to uh, actually take the resource uh, from the wind that is in the sea, from the uh, waves that are in the sea, from the uh, tides that are in the sea, the first thing and almost uh, certainly also the last thing that we have to fight with is public acceptance. These technical challenges that we have, these planning challenges that we have, I think that those are something that we commonly can address and will address. But then it's the question how we also uh, sell this to the uh, greater uh, society. Thank you. Wonderful words. Giles. I agree with Prit on public acceptance. There's a fundamental problem here, which is that the rules and procedures for getting permits for new investments in generation and transmission capacity are too complex and they must be simplified. And at the same time, national, regional, municipal governments need to ensure that they're putting sufficient headcount resources into the processing of permit applications. It needs a lot of civil servant time. And I'm afraid the resources are not there collectively today. Secondly, if I may make a second observation on what needs to happen to deliver the Green Deal, 
governments need to make sure that signals for investment are in place. The Green Deal requires huge volumes of investment. Finding the money is not a challenge, but actually incentivizing investors to invest their money is a challenge. And the key thing here is making sure there is always a perspective of revenues and that the investments are going to pay back. Now, this means a range of things. For those building wind farms, onshore or offshore, it means some form of revenue stabilization mechanism so that they can go to the banks, they can borrow money at low rates of interest because the banks can see there's going to be some revenue going into that investment. For those looking to develop hybrid offshore wind farms with connections to two or more countries, it means a redistribution of the congestion revenues because without that, potential investors in hybrid offshore wind farms because of the 70% rule do not see a clear enough revenue perspective. And finally, for the TSOs themselves, it means shifting from this old-fashioned CapEx-only model of sourcing revenue to cover investments towards a Totex model, where in the future, TSOs will be able to claim back from the regulators the amounts that they are investing in flexibility, storage, and other non-classic investments and count that towards the revenues that they say they need to cover their investments. So shifting TSOs from CapEx only to a Totex business model. Thank you. I'm I'm lost, I guess. <laughs> so well, for me, for me personally, a green deal is actually is uh, providing a future for my children and my grandchildren, and uh, preferably a, a green and and a carbon free future. Uh, now, as a, as a civil servant or a, or a government, and I hear what uh, Giles has said and the, the other colleagues also, we, they are dearly noted. Uh, the, the the big challenge is that we we are still working on the national energy and climate plan. From the from the clean energy package, we are still working on the energy market uh, directive, and we now have uh, again a new green deal. So I hope we get some time, although there is not much time, much time to work on this. On top of that, I, uh, we had a corona crisis, so we have to see how we fit all those things together. Uh, so, and as I said, the, the energy and climate plans, they can serve for the resilience and the, the building up of Europe after the crisis and, and so on. But it, it's going to take us a while. But all in all, let's stay positive. The Green Deal is a green deal for all Europeans. Thank you. And Gerald says that he is kicked out. Uh, is that possible? <laughs> So we are without uh, uh, moderators? Every day, on the European power grid, the TSOs implement hundreds of projects. Ah yes, the grid needs to be maintained. While work is ongoing, the relevant equipment is unavailable. TSOs therefore need to be informed when their counterparts are carrying out work so that they can avoid particularly tense situations on the grid. Up until now, this coordination was mainly done between bordering countries. Only bilaterally, in other words. Watch out, we're switching it off. Everything OK over there? We really should think about coordinating these things. We can't carry on like this. Now, the RSC suggest checking all the possible combinations of upcoming work to see if any will compromise the grid's availability. If I understand correctly, if they do work there, they can take that route, but they will then have this line. I've got it. Watch out, we're switching it off. If this is the case, the RSCs suggest corrective solutions such as cancelling works on certain lines to maintain the electricity flow. Oh, uh, uh, we're not switching it off. Ah, there we go. That wasn't too hard. This service, provided a year or a week in advance, optimizes works management on the European grid, improving its availability and safety. Gotcha.
Thank you so much for the last panel and it's actually time to kick out uh, this uh, moderator here on the stage because we're uh, slowly but firmly uh, ending our day here. Uh, for the closing remarks, I would like to welcome the Baltic RSC representative Veiko Aunapu onto the stage. This is the last time you're going to see me. Thank you so much, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, for spending a very interesting time uh, here with us today. Dear Commissioner for Energy, participants, speakers, moderators, panelists, we have reached the end of the RSC conference. My name is Veika Onopu and I'm the project manager responsible for organizing this year's RSC conference. On behalf of Baltic RSC and the conference organizational team, I'd like to thank you all for giving us your attention and time. One of the aim of this year's conference was to focus on digital cooperation. This headline was set already in January, but during the decision making, we could not have imagined how relevant this topic would become in the following months. The conference team had to adapt to the changing environment every week, the same way as the RSCs, TSOs, and the whole energy community had to adapt to the changes brought about by the COVID-19 virus. This event would not have been possible without our speakers, moderators, and panelists, who filled the day with interesting ideas, discussions about the future of our power systems, and the challenges we are facing. Thank you all for giving us your thoughts and the insight. To participants, I hope that you were able to find something new, whether it be a new thought, idea, or a change of heart, whether it be the potential of open source mindset in the code development, the potential of offshore wind in the European networks, or just an understanding on why we need RSCs in the energy community. Whatever it was, take it with you, act on it, however big or small it would be. Last, but definitely not least, I would like to thank our team, with whom we held numerous Teams calls, it, but it was not always easy. I think everyone here can agree on that. And for making sure everyone was connected and for keeping me in focus until the end of my speech, warm words go out also to our cameraman and the technical team. With this, I would like to close 2020 RSC conference. And I really hope to meet you all at the next RSC conference next year in person to share new thoughts and ideas on Europe's energy future. Thank you all for your cooperation today and in the future.